And Brian Adler, <laughs> Brian Adler, Adler, wanted, that, yeah. Brian Adler <laughs> wanted him on the phone because he could speak posh. He described a poncy BBC voice. <laughs> oh, yeah. The one in my office down there. Oh, oh number that's, one. Yeah, number <laughs> one. Number <laughs> one. Unmade. I would get on a plane as the my luggage, and I would fly to Baltimore and work on the same issue of White Dwarf in America oh, for a week, and then come back and pick up White Dwarf in the UK. <laughs> and I did that for something like nine months. We used to refer it to, yeah. refer to the studio as the fuzzy felt department. <laughs> <laughs> well, science fiction games don't sell, you know. <laughs> so um, even the boss wasn't always right. Yeah, no, absolutely it, not. And as Andy Jones tells it, at that point he turned around and there was a guy with a with a rifle covering him in a police uniform. He goes, "Oh, is this part of it?" As well as my shit. Well, if it's less than two grand, I'll have it. I love Into the AM clothes. So when they reached out to sponsor a video. I almost cried. The nights are drawing in, the temperatures are dropping, and Into the AM have just launched their fall collection, or autumn collection, if you're British. So their online store is now full of hoodies, button-ups, jumpers like this one that I'm wearing, joggers, which are apparently insanely comfy. But if keeping warm isn't your thing, they have their huge selection of graphic tees, like, This one I'm wearing here. Smooth. And if graphic tees aren't your thing, their basic tees come in loads of colours. The cut and quality of these are absolutely fantastic in everything that they do. They didn't even send me this one. I bought it because I like it so much. Peach and Jeff in this episode of Sidetracked are wearing their own items from the four collections. So if in the over an hour and a half episode that you're about to watch, you think, damn, they look stylish, you know where to go. So go check out Into the AM if you want to upgrade your wardrobe and elevate your style. Using the link down in the description, you'll get 10% off anything you want to purchase. They also have multi-packs of shirts if you want to buy bundles, which are already discounted, so you'll get 10% off those as well. Smashing. Enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Peachy. Hi, I'm Jeff. And you may notice we're in different surroundings today with a very different backdrop and very different guests as well. So uh, as is always with our, uh, our chat shows, we'll we introduce these lovely fellas in a moment or two. Um, we have a Patreon. So if you want to have the opportunity to ask some questions, then consider joining the Patreon. There's many tiers uh, and you get to ask questions like the Colossus that is John Stallard or the Giant that is Robin Jews. And together it makes them seem the same size. That is a reference from Michelin Web, if anyone knows that. That is a terrible, terrible reference. Uh, so without further ado, have you never seen it, Pat? Pat is here, by the way. Pat is here. He's just not visible. No, He's there's over there not enough of mics, apparently. There he is. <laughs> we, we can see him if you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. So um, I'm going to introduce our guests. So if you don't know anyone uh, out there, you don't know who these are, I'd be surprised if you don't know who they are, but chances are you might not. We have John Stallard and Robin Jews. Hello. John, Hello would there. you briefly introduce who you are, what you do, and maybe what you did? Uh, I'm John Stallard. I run Warlord Games in the mighty Nottingham. And before that, I was at Games Workshop for about 24 years. So, uh, a man and boy type thing. <laughs> Here we are. That is a long time. <laughs> a long time ago. You have to push that bicycle up a cobbled street to get to Games <laughs> Workshop back then. <laughs> it, was, it was like that to Enfield Chain. <laughs> And what about you, Robin? Well, uh, my name's Robin Hughes, and I joined Games Workshop in 1989, March, in fact, 13th of March. Uh, and then I work, went straight into the design studio. I'd done some stuff as a freelancer for, for Games Workshop before then. Got some stuff published in White Dwarf, saw a job, and went, I can do that. So I got a job in the studio. Then in 1990, I became White Dwarf editor. So I edited White Dwarf in the early 90s, from 91, I think, to 95. And then I took over the job of studio manager for the rest of the 90s into the noughties. So that golden Amazing. period of all of the most wonderful games in the world came out of that studio. Yeah. We, we were debating before the, the before you came, we were like, were you before Paul Sawyer or after Paul Sawyer? Oh, before Paul It was Sawyer. Paul before. Were you, be, were you before my friend then? That's the next one. Were you before Jake Thorne? I was. I recruited Jake Thorne and trained Jake Thorne to And A.D. Wood. Oh, right. Jake, Jake and A.D. were two of my recruits. Yeah, I, I became White Dwarf editor. 
after, in 1991, and it was actually, no, 1990, let me think, I did 50 issues, that's four years and two months, 139 <laughs> to 189. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't even remember what I did in the studio, so uh, <laughs> kudos. 50, 50 issues, but I got my first mention in 113, which yeah. is when I joined the company. Amazing. So we, we are, obviously, that, that we'll be delving into like backstories a lot, because that is probably the, the vein of this show, but you recently produced a book called Talking Miniatures. We did. Which um, is very, that, that kind of stuff's really close to my heart because we've had a few guests on our channel which have talked about stuff in the past. Oh, look at that, right. look at that. <laughs> volume like, one and volume two. Wow. This was rehearsed. With we spent 14 as well. minutes <laughs> rehearsing this. <laughs> we didn't. Um, this We're not great. advertising this at all. <laughs> I do have a question later on about volume three, so we'll come to that. Okay, we'll <laughs> if there is a volume three. Go for it. Um, but yeah, so um, talking about stuff from the past, certainly from my era, those rose tinted glasses and stuff, it's really good. And having that put down in paper format, so there's a living document of it in history, so we don't forget it. I mean, we, we've had a few people on the sh chat show, we've talked about stuff like that. I guess I've answered my own question, really. Go on, but go on. the question is, what made you start, when did you start this project and what was, did it actually become what you expected it to be? Or is it more than that now? John, do you want to have a go at that? I'll have a go for it. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll pitch in if I see anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, according to Robin, up to five years ago now. Five we, years ago you started this? We over, were, over five years ago. Uh, Robin and I uh, kept in touch when we both left workshop and Robin does a lot of training things for people uh, to keep his hand in. and. Uh, we came over, came over to my place and we're chatting away, sitting in the garden, having digestive biscuits and drinking tea. And either of us came up with one or more ludicrous story from Games Workshop and uh, and how we laughed. And uh, and we thought, yeah, they wouldn't believe it now. And I think, no, no, you wouldn't. And then we said, yeah, well, there's a few people popping off now, you know, and there's not so many of us around anymore, uh, which is true. Mm, bless them. Yeah. And, uh, and we said, well, God, we should probably write this down, you know. Some some idiot's got to write it down. Yeah, so yeah. some idiots did write it down. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't you though, right? <laughs> <laughs> ah, no. We thought we could, we so we thought we should we should write a book, and uh, and uh, and then that crystallised into we shouldn't write it. We should get X Games Workshop people other than us to write the book. So um, the plan was to find as many uh, X Games Workshop employees because. The ones who work for workshop aren't allowed to give interviews and mm. such, uh, uh, generally. And so we found 17 confederates and people who we all knew from the old days <laughs> who we thought would be interesting and will have a great story to tell. Mm. So in the end, it's it's um, certainly not a history of Games Workshop because uh, Sir Ian, Ian uh, has already done that, the, the Dice Men. Oh, book, of course, yeah. yes, yes. Which, excellent book, by the way, if you want the history. But this tells stories. Uh, and uh, so we found 17 people. Uh, some we weren't able to find, and some we just couldn't fit in. If you notice, it's 500 pages, so that's why it's in two volumes. And uh, there's awful, an awful lot that we haven't included, isn't there, Robin? There's quite a lot that we haven't included. So, uh, For various reasons. <laughs> uh, legal reasons, we maybe. We may not go into. <laughs> so what we did was, uh, over this period of five years, obviously because of uh, COVID and all that, it mm -hmm. took a bit longer. And some people were abroad and all that. So we did some by uh, uh, over the web, but mostly it was one-to-ones, wasn't it? We did face-to-face. -face. We started out face-to-face. -face, you know, we'd, I mean, the project started with John and I actually went round to Rick's house. You know, Rick Priestley, who's an old mate. And we just, I've got a little digital recorder. And I just punked it down on the table. And John and I said, OK, Rick, tell us how you came to work for Games Workshop. And, and, and these stories started to flow. And what... I found amazing listening back to the tapes is lots of these people have been interviewed before. You know, Rick's very famous, of course, as, as a games designer. But when people talk to him or Andy Chambers or Jervis Johnson, it's all a bit differential. It's kind of, you know, Mr. Priestley, please tell us your wisdom. Yeah, Whereas yeah. what we got on tape was three old mates sitting around, drinking tea, chuntering about the old times. And a story from John would trigger a recollection in Rick, which would trigger a story from me. And we were all there at the same time, and we came away from that meeting with Rick going, heresy! That was amazing. Yeah. I never heard anything like that. And then we rolled into 
Oh, who was next? We saw Paul at your around your kitchen Paul table. Paul Sawyer, yeah, was he, was, it? he was very good. Paul Sawyer, and then and we, the uh, magnificent and, Perry Twits. Oh, the Perry Twits. Were, <laughs> the Perrys, the Perrys were insane because they have a hive mind. They finish each other's sentences. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is that always seems to be like a stereotype with twins, but I have heard with the Perrys that it's not it really, real. Thing. It really yeah. is. I'm actually trying to decode the tapes. With oops, oh, sorry, my watch is starting to talk. We've <laughs> <laughs> got a, a fifth uh, person in the interview now. And, and, and whilst we're interviewing them, in, in comes a squirrel through the window. <laughs> <laughs> and they're feeding it peanuts. We're trying to have this sensible conversation. There's a bloody squirrel involved. Is that in the now. book as well? Please tell me. Uh, I think the squirrel, I think, uh, I think the, the editors know at this point the squirrel came into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And, and, and so. What I think what Talking Miniatures is is something really unique, and actually, you know, mm. I kind of, I've got to be proud of this because with John we put this together. But I've never seen a story told in that way because it's the story told in the voices of the people who are there. Yeah. It's not a third person kind of collecting this and then rewriting yeah. it. It's their voices, and, and we made a very quick decision not to kind of write this as a, a narrative, but let the voices speak. Well, know, it's so like an oral history, really. It's an oral narrative. history. It's yeah. actually those people, and it's That's not true. just. The designers, either it's not just the you know the studio people. We talk to a whole range of people from you know salesmen and what we call the craftsmen and the cat herders. <laughs> Tony Epworth, who's a master mold maker, who, yeah, yeah. who if you had bought a Citadel miniature in the 1980s, Ep would have made the mold for it. And he knows as much about mold making as anyone on this planet. And lots and lots of different kinds of people uh, from the company. It was, it was just really exciting. And after 17, I, I phoned up John and said, John, I think we've got nearly. 500 pages here we've got 200,000 words what are we going to do with it? and that's where we got to I, sp I suppose the thing you touched on there as well is like because you're, you're chatting in that kind of like comfortable environment it is more sort of it's not rehearsed it's not too strict it's just chilled out conversational because we find that when we have like chats and stuff and like well I talked to like Dave Andrews or like people even now like the Paris or some at the weekend at parties and stuff yeah you know you're in that relaxed environment so you, you're giving a bit more and you're comfortable with the people you're talking to when normally you get like the interview sort of podcasts and things like that or like yeah you go and do an editorial yeah, yeah. level stuff it, it's a bit more you're not defensive but you, you you only give the information to the question that you're asked right yeah you do and, and it's what i call a bit deferential the yeah. interviewer is a bit deferential to the you know they're, it's they're, a big word i don't even know what it means well they're, treat, <laughs> they're, they're, they're treating people as if they're extraordinary or famous yes, or something yeah. not and, 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 yeah, and yeah. we're not we're just yeah. people you know i was lucky I got in the right place at the right time and, and worked hard and did, a, yeah, decent, did yeah. a decent job. I'm not, you know, I'm not a Rick Priestley or a Jez Goodwin. You know, these people are super talented. I was just in the right place at the right time and I could do the job that was needed to be done, as was John. He could do the job that needed to be done. He joined Citadel as the salesman when he was the only salesman. <laughs> <laughs> and it was because he had a posh voice. And Brian oh, yeah. Axel <laughs> wanted, yeah. <laughs> wanted him on the phone because he could speak posh. He described a Ponzi BBC voice. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. Probably, it's probably not allowed to say that these days. <laughs> so I should be cancelled, sorry. <laughs> and that's the truth of it. And actually, it's all of the people. You know, Trish Carden, Trish Morrison, she was then. You know, she started out as a jewellery student. She, yeah. she was making yeah. jewellery. That was her, That's where she let, learnt her skills as a Smith and a craftswoman was making jewellery but then her boyfriend was Ali Morrison he was making little miniatures she went oh can I have a go at that and that's how Trish became yeah. a golden miniature designer yeah. so, so then we, had, we had masses of tape well Robin had masses of tape and uh, and we gave it to the amazing Helen Morley who's in the book as well to type it all up and uh and try and work out which of the Perrys was talking. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, both at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just gave up halfway through. It's one of the Perrys is talking. <laughs> and so she, she typed it all up. Uh, thank you, Helen, by the way. And then that came back to Robin, who then super edited it and said, oh, you know, I think that's what they meant to say. And you know, we can't always catch every word. So, uh, and then we got the manuscript together. So that's, uh, and then an awful lot of um, research, mainly by Robin, I have to point out, uh, finding wonderful artefacts, finding the old white dwarfs, finding the old uh, mm. uh, games day ticket stubs, oh, all right, this thing. Yeah. And so we went around all our mates. Have you got any old T-shirts? Have you got any of this? Come take oh, a picture of that. Well, if only had known, you know, I so, could uh, help you out with that. <laughs> I have a friend who's got a, an avid collector of everything. He's like, well, he used to be GW, and he's got everything that he's ever attended. Still, yeah, Andy Jones has all of that kind yeah, of collection yeah. as well. Yeah, we actually, I don't think we put it in the book. We did, did have the pictures of the two unmade Thunderhawk gunships as they're well. In. Oh, they're, they're in. There. They're in. Yeah, you and Paul. You and Paul. Are these ones in the nice wooden display case? Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. The one in my office down there. Oh, oh number, one. Yeah, number one. Number <laughs> one. Unmade. That'll be worth a lot. Yeah, just saying ex- extra shutters on Warlord now that that's gone out to the public. <laughs> Take a picture of that before you go. That would be good. So, so what, Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, for me, and I think for John as well, I mean, the whole project, we, we made up this project because we thought it was a really cool thing and we should do it because we're all getting old. You know, we're old men now. We're not, we're not youngsters. Mm. We're getting old and decrepit and we are going to start forgetting this Ducker. before. And we, need, <laughs> we needed to write it down. Uh, but it was a real labour of love. And yeah. for me, you know, um, we, we, had, we both had good careers at Games Workshop. We we're mm. kind of comfortably in our old menness. Yeah. And what I, but I, what I wanted to do was do something that people would love, that people who are in the hobby, and I've just, just been fantastic for me. I run a little Facebook group called Talking Miniatures, where people can, you know, it's just an open group just around the book. And people that have come into that say, oh, God, I was 14 when you were a yeah, yeah. editor. And can it, these, these are guys who are now 40 or 50 with kids of their own. And yeah. it's just been really fantastic to connect back through this book with that time and with these people who are just so happy. I mean, like when I was a kid, I mean, I'm of the era when you, when I was, oh, this is going to make you feel old. Do apologize. I, I, I am old. <laughs> it's, 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 I am old. It's okay. But when I was a teenager, I had the white dwarf in the back of the car and there was like, you know, your face on there. And there was like Necromunda like scenarios and battle reports and stuff. And I was like really into those. And, you know, it, it, there's so much nice nostalgia. And, I do think that, like, as, as White Dwarfs progressed over the years, it, it's lost a bit of that. And it's such a shame that, that there are elements. I think it's coming back with, like, some of the new stuff that they're doing, like, that, like the, the way that the, the, the magazine is handled. And I've got, there's a really good question by one of our patrons, which I'll chuck out near the end. But, um, but yeah, hearing these stories just reminds me of all those, those good times I had when I was younger and I was getting into the hobby. And I think that's true. But we also have to make no bones about it. What yeah. Workshop is doing today is breathtaking. Oh, God, yeah. What absolutely, they're doing yeah. with plastics and engineering miniature, I just, I kind of, ah, ah, ah. But at the same time, it makes me really, really kind of go, why do you, do you remember what we were doing? Because, you know, that, those early White Wolves, mm. you know, we're talking analog here. Yeah. Everything was analog. There was no digital data. There wasn't any digital, digital publishing data. In that early 90s period, I used to work on a White Dwarf in the UK for three weeks. We would get films. I'm not going to know what I'm talking about here. But these were films back from the printer, not digital files. Yeah, no, yeah. Literally printed uh, negative films. Yeah, like microfiche. Uh, no, but actually, full oh, si- right. full full size, full page films laid out on sixteen page sections. Wow! I would roll them up. I would get on a plane, is the my luggage, and I would fly to Baltimore and work on the same issue of White Dwarf in America oh, for a week, and then come back and pick up White Dwarf in the UK. <laughs> and I did that for something like nine months until Jeremy Vitop was um, and Drew Will were in the studio in Baltimore, and that's what they're doing. So everything was analog. The, the photography was analog. Camera on your phone? No. No. <laughs> no. You set up a shot for a battle report and you were shooting on film. Yeah. So you'd take a Polaroid. Remember those clips? Yeah. Yeah. That would come out. You'd take a Polaroid to set the shot and then you'd bracket it. You'd take the shot. You'd open the stop. You'd open the, the F-stop one to get a little bit bit more light in. You'd close it down to shut it down and that'd be it. You'd then send it to a processor and that was it. If it came back, it came back. If it didn't come back, you were screwed. Oh, wow. That's the, yeah. that's the way it was in those days. Every aspect. We used to refer it refer to the studio as the fuzzy felt department. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 weirdly, I did a little bit of, not editorial, but I did some uh, magazine making when I was uh, at college and I went to this um, work placement and I got a massive appreciation of White Dwarf at that time because I, I, I probably not the same, it was obviously a bit more high tech, but a lot of it was like cutting out articles, sticking them in onto a page with, with a text underneath it, aligning it photocopying it that's right because it was all like you know random bits of information you had to st- st- stagger together to put into one page and i was like is this how they make white dwarf because this is taking forever and i i did one magazine like in in like a week because i was obviously young and idiotic and i didn't know what i was doing still don't to be fair um <laughs> I just i just wing my way through life it seems to be going all right at the moment but yeah it, it just seeing that kind of process and when I moved into the studio as well, like all the things that went beyond the scenes, I was like, how is this business still alive? <laughs> Some of the well, stuff that goes off. But, but, <laughs> but again, it coming back to the book and what we've, what we've done, you know, one of the unsung heroes that comes to the book, and I think it's Richard Ellard and somebody else talks about it, is Charlie Elliott. And you kind of mm. go, who's Charlie Elliott? Yeah, I was going to ask who's Charlie Elliott. Elliott. Who's, who the hell is Charlie Elliott? Charlie Elliott is the guy that designed Warhammer 40,000 Road Trader. 
Wow. That book that has since been published, you know, was published in 1987. Yeah. So a 40-year-old book. It's been republished in facsimile editions by Games Workshop on the and 30th just again, anniversary. And announced again. And they've just uh, announced it again. Charlie yeah. Elliott was the graphic designer yeah. that worked in the studio. And the look and the feel of that book is in the hand, came out of the yeah. hands and the brain of Charlie Elliott. Anyone ever heard of Charlie Elliott? He's called Chaz Elliott. He was a mate of Tim Pollard. He appears in the book. Richard Ellard, who we interview in the book, actually gives him that due credit and says, yeah. the guy that, you know, the debt that we owe to that guy. Because that book is still as sexy as hell. Yeah, and you look yeah. at it and go, wow, look at this. It's cool. It's planets. It's space. It's space marines. But it has that dark, grim feel yeah. that people really resonate with. And that's Charlie Elliott. Yeah. Oh, it was something extraordinary when it came out, that, 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 that book. It was mildly sinister. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, Got a copy. Pe I'm... People just, you know, they, you didn't know what to do with it. They think, wow. Well, there's a lot of satire in it as oh, well, isn't there? Oh, you know, a lot of a lot of reflection of, of 1980s of, of Britain, I think, when you look at it. There is a lot. Yeah. There is a lot. You, and you can tell that a lot of it is, it's like, it's like 2000 AD. You can tell that it's people involved and in that have at some point in time been punks and have been you know, quite rebellious students. It was and hippies <clears throat> and it was punks and yeah. it was kind of all that non... Well, on the back of the book, we describe it as the, the group of rebels, non-conformists that yeah. kind of gravitated towards Sizzle Miniatures yeah. because, you know, Miniatures and Toys Holders were rock and roll at the time. Yeah. I mean, imagine a world with no computer games. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There were no computer games. There was a ZX Spectrum, if you were lucky, <laughs> in 1983. But actually, if you wanted to engage with fantasy and science fiction, miniatures were the way to do it. If yeah. you wanted to participate in stories, there were no, yeah. uh, no there were no games. There were no, there were no um, consoles. None of that. This Pop was it. Pong, maybe. This Pong. was it. Maybe Pong, yeah, yeah. if you were lucky. <laughs> this was it. And this was how, through fantasy gaming and tabletop gaming, is how you engage with yeah. fantasy and sci-fi. Yeah. That's why it was so cool and why it was so edgy rock and roll. Interesting, the books of those eras, because I did illustration at uni, influenced my art style, just like that pen and ink, kind yeah, yeah, of just yeah. real simplified like art style. You know, and, you, know, you get like comic books, artists and stuff like that, and loads of graphic designers nowadays are very colourful. And But I was just very black and white, line drawings, just because... It was all the stuff, like the Ian Miller art and stuff like that. You but know, but that's really... no, again, Chris, that's no trivial thing because actually what was going on there, and it's, you know, a lot of this goes down to Tony Ackland and John Blanche, mm. is that a lot of the fantasy stuff, particularly the fantasy stuff that was coming out of... Um, I'm, I'm smiling because of a line from Tony Ackland in the book that I might tell you about. But Please do. a lot of that fantasy <laughs> stuff was coming was coming out of America. And America was very comic book. Yeah. And so what you got coming out of American <clears throat> fantasy art was this very comic book style. Um Whereas what was coming out of the UK is, you know, people like John Blanche and Tony Atkins. John was really into Mervyn Peake and Gorman Gast and, mm. that, you know, Ian Miller and that really dark, bleak, kind of uh, almost pre-Raphaelite kind of style of painting. That, that's what they emulated and that's, mm. what, that's, what they, what, that's what they created in Games Workshop products. And that was very different. But now that's the standard style. Yeah. If you yeah. look at things like Games of Game of Thrones and all of that, it's got that dark, gritty, punk yeah. realism about it that wasn't there in the 1980s. It came out of Games Workshop. And yeah. it came out well, of those. well, I think as well, I think, um, <clears throat> I think it went sort of tandem with 2000 AD. They were very much the same. Because I always think whenever I think of the Empire, I always think of the 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 the, the sort of totalitarian society that is uh, the humans in Nemesis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, behave, be pure, be vigilant, and and all of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's. But it was what was around. It was what was around at the time. You know, everybody stands on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, and, and right. Games Workshop didn't and, pop fully formed into the, the world. And the, the same thing as what you're saying about that art style is the fact that uh, Kevin O'Neill drawing nemesis yeah. it was all just pure black and white exactly pen you know very much pen exactly. style art on it and it you can see how it's you know it all it's all it, that that whole i think it's funny isn't it because i think to create the worst societies the most sort of despotic <laughs> societies you need the people who are most anti them sorts of societies Absolutely. to to reflect them in the mirror, I think, really, don't you? No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's 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 slightly tongue-in-cheek. The the byline you'll see on the front of that book says, how the Lincoln Model Railway and Wargaming Society changed the world. And it did change the world. And yep. what's the Lincoln Model <clears throat> Railway and Wargaming Society? It's where the 13 or 14-year-old Rip Priestley went with his mate Richard Halliwell because they were Lincoln schoolboys. And there, were, there was a model railway with the old boys doing train track upstairs mm. and there were the war gamers downstairs and that's where they met out of that came reaper which they published when they were 17 years old it was oh, their well, first yeah. science fiction no the fantasy set of rules because they wanted to fight the battle of uh 
Helms Deep. The Helms Deep and Pelennor Fields, but there were no rules for it, so they wrote their own. And out of that, they got both became involved in Citadel. Out of that came Warhammer. Out of that came 40K. All of that imagery, all of that, they changed the world. Yeah. yeah. I bet with, with those books, that's stuff that a lot of people probably won't even realise. No, because no, it's not been mentioned before. Well, I, 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 actually got a phone, passing I actually got a phone call from some, someone in Lincoln. Some reporter got hold of this, and he was saying, "Oh, we should put a blue placard." Up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not such a tough it's idea. Not, it's not is it <laughs> no, really when I mean, you think about well, it? Well, the workshop day, is yeah. just well, as we know, it's, 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 it's a behemoth. It's just unbelievable. It, it's a and it, you know, it, it, and it's. Well, it's a rite of passage for most young lads and some girls these days, isn't it? Yeah. I think I've seen blue plaques for less. Yes, so that's yeah. what I mean. You know, <laughs> but, they've influenced so many youngsters, and well, all of us now, yeah. and, uh, uh, as a great force for good. Uh, and, uh, um, I mean, what comes through in, in, in the book is... Um, is the wonderfulness of making it up as you go along ish that happened. Yeah. There, was, there was nobody to follow yeah. because there was no no big games company. And if you went to the bank manager in 1982 and said, can I have a million pounds? I want to sell goblins. You'd be, <laughs> you'd be marched out the bank very quickly, I suspect, yeah. as a yeah. madman. Yeah. And, uh, and yes, uh, with Brian Ansell, um, uh, who, who's, who is very highly uh, praised throughout the book by all 17 people you will see. Mm. With his vision about what he was trying to create, uh, uh, he got these, you know, this, this bunch of desperados together and made it all work. But yes, but there's no guy, there's nothing to follow. Yeah. Nowadays, it's much easier to open up a games company yeah. and do things. That's, that's what I did. Because uh, I can now see what's good, what's cool, yeah. what not to do broadly. I'm not saying we always get it right, but, yeah. uh, but what's really cool mm. and, what, and what's what what's paramount and and workshop did that it was a and and you know, their two watchwords are always fantastic quality yeah. whatever it, whatever it takes it has to be brilliant and then fantastic customer service yeah. which yeah. would I have drummed into you so oh, yeah. over Absolutely. the years and all of us at Gaines Workshop mm. and uh, those two things uh, came directly from Brian and his wife Diane Ansel they beat those into us uh, very much though uh, and it's carried through to workshop, you know, the, the quality again. Yeah. Mm. But as you say, though, it's sort of like starting on a wing of a prayer and, and it just, and it worked. Was, that came across through with our interviews with Bob and both with Trish. They both at times almost pretty much say, we're stunned it worked because it was just so, you know, so you know, scatter shots not the right choice of word, but it was so random. Uh, and it, but it managed choice of word. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that it managed to actually that it actually managed to they they you know they put the plane in the air, but they also managed to land it as well. And you but, know. but but also again, it's important not to have rose tinted spectacles on that. No, some of it worked, and yeah. one of the challenges for Games Workshop at that time was was chasing up success. Some of it didn't work, and some of the stuff that should have worked didn't work you know what didn't work dark future didn't work yeah it yeah. was a brilliant idea i love the game to this day i i've, I've got half a dozen copies still at home yeah. that kind of but why didn't it work we don't know it didn't work it didn't catch fire it didn't catch an audience it didn't sell so actually it was dropped and it was lost yeah. from the, it lost from the range not everything worked all sorts of stuff were thrown out there you, you think it would because it was that area of mad max and you know a lot of people are into that kind of stuff i, I often think from my experience of working in the studios and there's something i'm very keen on doing is when i paint and play toy soldiers I try and keep the scale the same I try and like yeah, yeah. make it interchangeable so if I do Age of Sigma I do Warcry and I, I can do like other skirmish level stuff for those models Battlefleet Gothic and then Dark Future uh, like you have to like really commit to a very different game with a very different asset that you can't use anywhere else you can't but I mean Dark Future was done in that scale because yeah. why because Corgi existed yeah, so there was exactly, a whole range yeah, of yeah. die cast metal cars that you could stick guns and plastic bits on yeah. and so yeah, you, but, but if it was it. done now they would have made all those things in 28mm in 28mm you didn't, you didn't have the money to make yeah. those so that was, the, that's why you made it smaller and yeah. the funny thing is there is a game isn't it Gaslands which uses the, the whole the whole yeah. idea is you just buy Hot Wheels and stick yeah, yeah. Them and convert and convert them and up and just do stick that. guns on them and, it, and, it, and it's landed now but couldn't land then and, which and is it's such a shame and I think it's quite important to understand both of those things because you know the company we were young men in a hurry just doing stuff yeah. you know banging stuff out and trying stuff out and Jervis talks about this in an interview as does Andy you know we're just throwing stuff out and if it's stuck then you chased it. So Adeptus Titanicus went out and it stuck. People liked the game. And that was the first time that Workshop got its signature style. Yeah. Because Adeptus was the first time we put models, terrain, dice, rules, templates, 
rulers yeah, yeah. in a box. That was the first complete package. Yeah. And whose decision was that? That must have been Brian saying, well, we're going to go for this. Because Wargaming at that point was you got a rule book from here and you bought some models from over here and you got some actually plastic and you cut and made your own template. I mean, it was just a DIY business yeah, yeah. when I was growing up as a kid in the 60s and early 70s. That's if you wanted to be into Wargaming, you had to do, do DIY. Workshop came up with this idea of the package and they did that first in Adeptus, and then they started following that with yeah. you know, Dark Future. Blood Bowl was the same package with the Aster Granite uh, when it did the second edition. And then by Warhammer 4th, after the buyout in 90, and that first one with the High Elves and the Goblins, even then, no money. So remember the... Uh, oh, the Sharpie Pointed Spear the Goblins. The Sharpie Pointed Spear Goblins, <laughs> which would take you out. <laughs> Health and safety and, and nightmare. The, and, the, and the cardboard stand-up of the Rock Lobber and the Dragon, because yes, we yeah. couldn't afford plastic. Yeah. We couldn't afford to do plastic. And then 40K obviously followed that the uh, couple of years later. That's going to answer a lot of questions, because I used to see a lot of comments like, why was it always like a cardboard cut of a, of a Dreadnought? Yeah, it makes no sense, really. Yeah. And again, you know, let's go analogue here, because now all sculpting is digital. Mm. Back then, sculpting was analogue, and yeah. I won't even go into the detail of how that's done, but you make a three-up, mm. and then it has to be pantographed down. Hang on, you're going into the detail of it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, John. <laughs> sorry, John, I'm a gobshite. I will talk for England. Yeah, good, <laughs> good. I mean, that's, that's why you're here. Talking yeah. miniatures. <laughs> Things that don't necessarily work. When you read Rick's, glo Rick's glorious chapter in there, Rick uh, describes his conversation with Brian when Brian says, well, science fiction games don't sell, you know. <laughs> so oh. even the boss wasn't always right. Yeah, No, absolutely it, not. There's an interesting bit of the book um, that I'm aware of, which you talk about Brian Ansel has a lot of um, ideas. And, oh, yeah. you know, we're saying, like, you know, don't always work. There was, yeah. like, obviously the music label yeah Warhammer Records good. yeah um, that was a good and plan my favourite story and I've heard it a few times when I was in the studio and Dave Andrews recorded it a few times um, was the paintball in, in, oh, in yes. the forest yes. Can, can yes. You, can you talk? I know there are other people probably best placed to talk about it because yeah, Robin tells a good story well, <laughs> I mean the story is Andy Jones' story because yeah. that actually happened just before I joined the company yeah. but actually at that time you know late 80s 87 88 uh, paintball was taking off and yeah. it was a cool idea and uh, Brian went oh that's a cool idea we could do something with this Dark Future was out we were trying to get some traction with mm. Dark Future to get some and so why don't we do a Dark Future paintball make some money out of it and so there was a company called Mythlaw that used to do costumes for Games Workshop at the time. You might have seen some photographs, and they did, they did these kind of big leather jackets with studs and spikes and horsehair helmets and all of this stuff. And so all of the studio staff and a lot of the sales staff piled into a couple of coaches. And Tom Kirby, who wasn't the, the, the chief exec at the time, but he's, he had a, a maiden aunt who owned a bit of um, woodland up in Yorkshire. So they piled into these two coaches... Brian handed out pistols, paintball guns on the coach. This is this is going to work. They headed up to these woods and started running around in these woods in Yorkshire, shooting each other with paintball guns, having a great time until they suddenly heard, put down your weapons, put down your weapons. <laughs> and as Andy Jones tells it, at that point he turned around and there was a guy with a with a rifle covering him in a police uniform. He goes, oh, is this part of it? As well as my shit. <laughs> <laughs> How bad could that have gone wrong? Do, do, do I shoot? shoot him and it was the South Yorkshire Armed Response Unit had turned up because somebody had said that two coach drivers had been captured by terrorists who were running around in the these woods um, and so that the whole of the Armed Response Unit turned up and they kind of they kind of put down their weapon oh, sorry, sorry mister I didn't mean to cause any trouble and actually they got away with it they weren't because they were on private land yeah they weren't they hadn't done anything bad and they, they hadn't kidnapped two coach they hadn't yeah. kidnapped two coach drivers they weren't arrested for anything bad and it just became part of the game Workshop legend. It's it is a great part. It of makes a great anecdote. It's not the time I imagine because you could have lost half the studio. Well, we could have done, if Andy kind of shot I would say acceptable casualties. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, but Andy tells the story very well. I mean, there are, you know, there are some natural raconteurs in in, in Games Workshop. Andy being one of them. Yeah. So if it did go bad, it yeah, yeah, you had one volume, probably. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but, but I think for, again for me, uh, researching this book, talking to people, you know, and it was a joy. I mean, you know, I got back in touch with Mike McVeigh, and I hadn't spoken to Mike for fifteen or twenty years. Mm. He used to live in my house at one point. Um, was just lovely. Did, did you ask him to live in your house or was he just there? No, he, he, <laughs> he, he just said, I need a room somewhere. And I said, well, I've got a spare room. Come live in, yeah, great, you know, come yeah. live in my house. And getting back in touch with Mike was a joy. But actually, there are stories that we got told that I didn't. Oh, yeah. No, Those and John and never. I'm kind of really. I, I didn't know that. Really, well, that's and, the point of the book, isn't it? Yeah, and it's all in the book, and it's all in the book. Stuff that we, ne I never knew. 
And and for me, you know, one of the, one of the most amazing conversations we had with John and Rick and I got in John's motor and we drove down to Carbis Bay in Cornwall to meet Tony Ackland. And we spent a night in the pub with Tony Ackland, as you might. And then the next day, we in a, in a little kind of bed and breakfast hotel, we put the record on the table <laughs> and Rick and Tony were there. And John and I were almost in the background of that conversation. Rick and Tony hadn't seen each other for a while. These guys were the design studio. Mm. Way back in 1981 or 1982, Rick was writing stuff. And Tony was drawing stuff. You remember Tony was illustrating all of the old Citadel catalogues in German with line drawings. Why are they line drawings? Analog, because half tone is difficult yeah, to yeah. produce, so yeah. line, line is easy to, to reproduce. And Tony used to do 30 or 40 of those a day, drawing the miniatures in front of him. And these two guys had this conversation. Yeah. It was fantastic listening to them reminisce about stuff, and there's some great stories in there, particularly Tony talking about doing a crosshatch sketch for the Perrys for a dragon and he just cross hatched it because he's an artist and he came back and the Perry sculpted it with cross hatching <laughs> on it and he said that were meant to be scales and the Perry said but yeah but you did cross hatching you little git <laughs> you know that was just me doing cross hatching uh, uh, that stuff that stuff was just so rich and so Amazing. great yeah. and I'd never heard any of that I'm sure John hadn't and we just we just loved it and we hope that people who buy the book and love the book will enjoy it too well, uh, uh, Sounds a bit, lots of gold, gold information. I, I'm going to ask the question. It's like picking a favourite child. Is there a particular chapter or person you chat to that was like, "This is a really fun story for me personally"? John, you have a go because I've been talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> fun stories. There's so many fun stories in there. The the the, the one which uh, um, the one that meant the most to me, uh, not not the not the most entertaining. Yeah, was the one yeah. done by by Paul Robbins, who was the factory manager at Eastwood, mm. when Games Workshop consolidated and everything up up into Eastwood. And, uh, and it's um, quite a, I think it's fair to say, it was a bit of a rough town in those days. Still, uh, had, had, still is. had seen better days. You said that, not me. Really. <laughs> oh, yeah. I literally went through it yesterday, so yeah, it's not and, changed. Uh, and it was an ex mine Slightly chapter. quicker than normal. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it suffered quite badly from all the closures and things, and uh, so it was picking, it's trying to pick itself up, and then we moved there, mm. uh, lock, stock and barrel, and uh, so we had to recruit all manner of um, manufacturing staff and... Uh, um, the studio was in in the Ivory Tower down in Nottingham, mm. uh, and uh, the people who did all the work were in Eastwood, and uh, so we had to get to get all these various people to work together. and And Paul writes a beautiful chapter about recruiting these people who big casters, big burly casters who have been down some mines before. I was going to say some of them miners, wouldn't they? They would ex miners, ex -miners. Yeah. and it's yeah. their families. It's their dad and son, mum and lad, uh, yeah. and you. Know, She's doing the packing. He's moving. He's doing the, using the forklift truck, whatever it might be. And it was a very tight, a wonderfully tight um, uh, family, yeah, you know. Yeah. And and everybody just stepped up to the mark and did a great job and took a huge pride in doing. It. And, and again, that was Brian talking about quality. It's got to be right. So they were quite rabid about it. Mm -hmm. And then you know, the, and the customer service. Um, you you lads are too young to. To, to remember this, but when I was a boy, and dinosaurs stalked the earth, and if you if you read uh, if you had a magazine, military modelling magazine, yeah. and said here's a new Zulu model, it's you know, seven shillings and sixpence. Um, it, uh, here's the address to write to. Uh, send a cheque or a postal order. Yes, yeah. No internet, yeah. no phone numbers, no picture of it either, because they can't be asked to do a picture of it because of what you were talking about. So you're sending off for this Zulu warrior, say that big, and you know it's going to be good because you've seen similar. Mm. But you send off your cheque or postal order, and it will say right at the bottom, allow 28 days for delivery. <laughs> I mean, when you're 14, 28 yeah, days it's two and a half years, is isn't it? two and a half yeah. years, <laughs> possibly more these days. And, and yeah. lo and behold, in about three and a half weeks, something would come through your door, badly packaged, uh, you know, uh, bashed about a bit because they hadn't put proper mm. wrapping in there. And that would come through, and you think, oh, I really spent my seven shillings and six on this. And then, but Brian way before his time said right mail orders coming in it, it, uh, again no internet so it's either yeah. telephone calls or normally letters big stack of letters would come through and Rick Priestley used to be my boss then mm. so he'd say John you open up these so you'd open up 30 letters uh, and in there would be photocopied um, a catalogue pages or sometimes our mail order sheets which are all in there quite laughing some of you will remember those and yes. people will, will, will ring fence and say times five or right, what's five of those orcs yeah. I think uh, <laughs> hard to tell and uh, but they'll come in Monday morning post they get that at half ten and Brian would say if you get them out by five o'clock today you know we'll go to the pub 
And you think, oh, blimey, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> it's motivation, so, isn't it? So you'd, you'd almost always turn them out either the same day or always next day. Mm, yeah. And uh, yeah. and so sometimes, if you if it came in on a Monday, uh, the person posted it on a Saturday, came in on the Monday, they got it on the Tuesday if it's first-class post. That's amazing, yeah. Well, nowadays... People wouldn't find that amazing, yeah. but it was truly astonishing in 1982. Yes, yeah, it was yeah. like magic, and yeah. people said, "Good God, you know, where's that come from?" And that was that was Brian's vision again, and putting it in a nice white box with all those trolls all over yes, it. Remember yeah. those? I've yeah. still got a box, still and it's so box. much fun, you yeah. know. And the, uh, that was great. And uh, and the mail order, the mail order department were called the mail order trolls in those mm. days, and they're proud to be a troll. A bit, <laughs> of a, a bit of a gag, but the quality was all there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and that's what that factory gave. And uh, it's a great chapter. That's yeah. my favourite chapter. I still yeah. remember the skulls offer that was done oh, for yeah. a time, and you had like, the different things you yeah. can collect. Depending yeah. on how much money you spent in the shop, you get like little skulls to yeah. get. Yeah, yeah. At home, I've got like a sheet oh. that's got two skulls. Well, uh, go and reclaim it at a workshop. They're just going. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not sure what you can get with two. I think you need at least ten to get some. I had the so. uh, the Space Marines that look like the, where they copied them for putting the uh, the flag up at Imogen. Oh, oh yeah, 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 that one. Yeah. I could yeah, never I get any of them wrists to meet up with the arms. <laughs> <laughs> so what a load of rubbish! <laughs> <laughs> Why are we well, praising them? Yeah, <laughs> what I always remember talking about sending off for, for miniatures and that. I've got the amount of times I've looked at it and never done it. Do you remember in the back of um, Marvel Comics you could buy complete Civil War oh, ones? Oh, those sets. I yeah. always used to dream of those Yeah, sets. me too. Or the Second World War. Yeah, it's always been War. an entire German army versus an entire American army in one box. I've never ever seen one. I'd well, love to know what the actual I can come in like. there. Oh, brilliant. I was obsessed with those. <laughs> yeah. despite, not, despite not buying American comics, I consider them a bit <laughs> crass. Uh, but when people would show me one, I'd see those. Whole army in a... Footlocker. 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 That's right, it and wasn't a footlocker. Foot, foot, right, exploding right. tanks and exploding bridges. And I think, think that must be astonishing. Even at eight, you think, no, that can't really be exploding. But you want it to be exploding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it'd be $22. And uh, you think, well, I'm eight and I live in Glasgow. How am I going to get $22 <laughs> and give it to someone in Milwaukee? Yeah. And then I look at it and it says zip code. No. You have no idea what a zip what's code is. Yeah, what's a zip code? Yeah. So I was dashed immediately. And I, had I gone to my parents, they'd say, are you mad? You know. Anyway, I have since seen these various sets. Oh, have you And really? they're even worse than you thought they were. Oh, made. really? <laughs> <laughs> the, the disappointment level after waiting 28 days to have one of these. They were mainly flat. They were flat, so they could just come out the mould easy. So oh, flat see. models. Oh. And the tanks were a different scale. The scales to the, to, were all to, over, to, the, oh, all over oh, the place. Yeah. I'm so glad to never bother now. It was shocking. But what you could do now is go on eBay eBay and buy one. Oh, and really? Retro. Yeah, there must be there. Oh, I must have to have a look because that. But you will not. Be, you'll be serious. So, so, so disappointed. <laughs> you saved yourself. <laughs> yeah, well, thank true. you for the thank you for the warning, just in case. <laughs> so, uh, uh, last thing on that. Yeah. However, I will say, and another thing. I'm yeah, turning, another I'm thing. turning into Robin now. <laughs> the Warlord Games have bought out all our, our epic system. I don't know if you've yes. seen the yeah, yeah. Napoleonics and American Civil War. The American Civil War one was inspired by those lockers. Oh, wow. Right. And so that's what I wanted. A great big box with 2,200 miniatures in. Yeah. Both armies, blue and grey, and that was inspired by those. So that's where nice. we came from. Nice. Yeah, nice. Well, that's cool. Yeah. That is but cool. you just done a bad job. I think the one that, I think <laughs> the one I actually did learn from a back from Marvel comic and then finally got when we were on a day trip in Blackpool and was hugely disappointed was Sea Monkeys when it <laughs> turned out. They, they don't have little arms and legs and faces. They're just <laughs> Brian Shrimp <laughs> Did you buy X-ray specs as well? Yeah, yeah absolutely, of course. Yeah, so I've got some if you want to buy some. <laughs> I still haven't seen a naked lady through them, but you never know. <laughs> did you buy snake oil as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Snake oil. I've got that much of it. I could sell you some, Rob. <laughs> Do you have a story about someone wanting you to trim down the detail of miniatures? Oh, well, that was one of our factory managers. Was it? Yes. Yes, he came from the outside. He didn't last He long. came from the outside. Uh, didn't uh, we, we got a whole bunch of people came in from the outside to tell us how to do things properly. Cleverly. They were Cleverly. Proper, they were proper people. They were all very clever. Yes. And the factory manager he, in, in one of our first management meetings said, I've been thinking about these miniatures. Do they have to be so detailed? <laughs> and we, yes. Is, because if you didn't put so much detail on them, you know, I could double the output of these. And I think, well, I'm sure you could. <laughs> but and another great accountant, who, who another accountant come to save Games Workshop, who said, I've been w looking through the range, and 
your best profit is on the Eldar Farseer. If you just sell a hundred times more of those... Oh, it's uh, crack you, on, uh, <laughs> yeah, You're not a gamer, are you, mate? <laughs> <laughs> Whole armies of Farseers, because it was so five pounds for yeah, one model. Yeah. It's a bit like, the, isn't it? You know, if you didn't put any ham in them ham sandwiches, the price could come right down. Yeah. Yeah. So your margin would be great. You'd charge for the ham, but not deliver it. <laughs> yes. Just maybe a bit of ham oil. Just so it yeah, yeah. yeah. God bless them. <laughs> Amazing. All of that. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm going to... Confess it now. I had a uh, customer service because we were talking about customer service things yeah, yeah. in the back of the books and stuff, and it was gothic. I I'd done a check <coughs> through postal order, did a postal mm. order, so that I was even able to do that at that time. I was 13, 14, wow. I know. I would saved up my money; it was birthday money, and I went for the Battlefleet Gothic set, so you got the full set, mm. and you can get an extra little bit of fleet with it. So I went for the Chaos one. And I sent it off, heard nothing for weeks. So I was like, "Oh no, it's not, not happened." Um, so I rung up and I said, uh, "We can't find it." So, be best to cancel your check. So I cancelled the check. The very next day, it turned up. <laughs> <laughs> what? I rung up and I said, "It's it's turned up." Because uh, you know what we did? We they told us to go down to Warmerwood. So we went down to Warmerwood and they gave us a copy with the, the stuff in. And then we went home. And the very next day, it turned up. But it was the wrong fleet. It was the Imperial fleet. Okay. Uh, so I had both the Chaos and the Imperial fleets uh, together, and I was like, I feel really bad. So my dad was like, Don't tell him, because my dad was always like, Don't tell him. Don't tell him. Get, get away get from now these days. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I rung up, and they just said, Don't worry about it. Keep it. Fantastic. Uh, that's so, why you never got your bonus that year, because <laughs> <laughs> I stole it. <laughs> even kid. But uh, even then, the customer service, and, and I'll, I'll praise customer service even now because I know a lot of the folks that work there, and they just they they'll nail it. And I had an issue even when I was working at work shop where something just didn't turn up and I'd, I'd patiently waited more than a year for the thing to turn up um it was it was a made to order it was 180 days you had to wait because it was like one of these art books that had come through and i'd kind of remembered but forgotten and it'd been like over a year um so i contacted them, they're like you've been quite patient uh, and they, they went above and beyond to, to find yeah, to yeah. find the copy even though it was out of print but they managed to get one so yeah customer service has never really changed i think it's always been a good thing. I was just, rem- you're just, I'm listening to that, I'm just reminded of that crazy story, and I think it's your story, but remember this, there was one of the retail chains, and the, and the guy kind of came in, a kid came into the shop, and he said, look, I bought these miniatures, and he opened the, the, the box, you know, a sliding box with a styrofoam tray, and there were a load of nuts and bolts in there, and the manager went, what? It was pottery, broken pottery. Was it, broken, it was broken pottery, nut, nuts and bolts, and the guy went, well, that's the retail, I don't know what's going on here, he said, but you know, we'll change that straight away. And, and then I think another one turned up, a very, very similar, similar shop. And there was some kid who'd obviously going into the shop, opening the box, taking it home, putting some bits of broken pottery in. His dad had access to a shrink wrap machine. He was re- no. re-shrinking so the box. coming in and either asking for a refund and or And saying, look, I've already one. got these. My, 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 my auntie bought me these, but I've got them. Can I change them for something else? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, of course, so the store manager, you could, you could rattle, but it was Terminator. So it was over the yeah. hot ones at the time. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. 20 pounds as well. <laughs> so you'd rattle it and it shrink wrapped it. Well, that's, you know. That's, that's terminated. That's complete. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like blooming pottery. And fortunately, <laughs> you know, we'd always said, always believe the customer. Always yeah, believe yeah, the customer. Yeah, yeah. And fortunately, we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just gave them a new box, but there was someone there. So I guess the ones that were get opening it were actually the innocent party here. Yeah, they're yeah, they're completely yeah. innocent. Yeah. They were they just bought oh, off the shelf. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Someone else was re-shrinking, taking the miniatures out and shrink-wrapping it and taking the box I out. Said, my more. time in retail, there was a time where there were people casting them out of plaster. Yeah, um, faster. Yeah, really? so I was like, uh, someone came in and said, "Oh, I brought this miniature, um, and it's broken." And I was obviously in customer service mode. It was a ring race, and they're like, "It's just broken, really weird." And I don't understand it. And I opened it, and I looked, and it was like just plaster. It was like, like, like plaster of Paris. Kind so it was of a like, fake, a fake miniature. Yeah, yeah. They've, what they've done, someone had made a mold yeah. of a ring wraith, yeah. so two part mold, and yeah. then just pour plaster into it, paint it all, and then. Uh, Try to. Uh, at so, first, I was so, just like, I was really confused. Then, it, then it happened a couple of times. I was like, ah, uh, they're trying to pull a fast one here, aren't they? It started to happen really. I think in, I mean, after the buyout in '91, when Tom took over the company and it, it became a public company, and started to expand really rapidly under John's kind of sales mm. leadership. You know, the, the retail chain started to expand rapidly, and then France came online, and Germany and Italy. You know, sales started to really, really, bo- really boom, mm. and a lot of money started to flow into the company. Um, that's when we started to first see serious counterfeiting yeah, and stuff yeah. coming in you know, with blister packs with miniatures that were clearly remolds and yeah. recasts um, what in from Turkey I remember Turkey that's I right. remember yeah. tracking them down that's yeah. a, that's me, me and Ronnie Renton went into a um, store yeah, in Germany yeah, yeah. there's a store in Germany which was selling these dodgy miniatures and um, 
whilst I distracted the shop owner, Ronnie nipped, in, nipped into the back and tore off an address label from Istanbul of one of the delivery notes. So that's how we tracked them down. Oh, wow. You've just reminded me, yeah, because it, these ring rays were coming in on a, they'd obviously taken the, the metal ones out and then yeah. put the plaster one in and, and resealed it together. It. So it looked like, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that's and, and that started to happen a lot in the late 90s. I did not yeah, I remember you. you I, I was a manager at the time when you were uh, head of like, sales. Was and I stuff nice like. to you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, was, yeah, I always found you to be the most sensible room in uh, sensible room in the voice, sensible voice in the room. Because um, we used to do lots of um, like manager meetings and stuff like that. And you always used to do a lot of presentations and stuff. Always. always that great. was until the managers' meeting in London, where someone had the good idea of hiring two open top buses and giving all the managers <laughs> water pistols and they're driving around London. One called Gorka, one called Morka. <laughs> Having a running, uh, having a running water fight, you know, until the police got involved. <laughs> it's guns, games you worship a guns, man. I mean, <laughs> they were only water pistols, but paint, uh, you traded well, down it, from paint guns to. It would have been funny if the guy, one of the cops who tracked you down, had used to work for the York. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, God, down to the again. Not you, <laughs> you <laughs> again. It no, was. It, I mean, back in there, it was anarchy at times. Yeah. It was anarchy, and, and but a beautiful kind of determined, focused. Kind of anarchy, but it was anarchy. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump on to some Patreon. Go, 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 go. Right. Yeah. But first of all, before I do that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah where can you buy this? Yes, yeah. uh, you can it? buy that. You can get it uh, uh, direct from us. I mean, Shaggy Dog Publishing is basically John and I set up a company to publish. Oh, it's a good name. So we said we said so. John, Shaggy Dog Publishing is John and I. It's got two directors. We have share capital of two pounds um, because we wanted to publish the book ourselves yeah. and get it out there. So that's so we set up Shaggy Dog Publishing. So you can get it straight from us at uh, talkingminiatures.co.uk yep. or Amazon in the UK or Amazon.com in America. Yeah, that's where it is. Or at, the at our retail store here. Yes, and our retail yes. store here. It's nice, nice to see the villains are actually on the back of the book. <laughs> well, the villains on the back on the on the sexy slipcase. There's all of the villains that are in the book, and each volume has a different group of people. On it, is so. there plans to do other volumes down the line? It kind of depends how this goes. Yeah. I mean, what's been brilliant for me at the moment is actually the response from people. You know, and I say I have this. Uh, we have a Facebook group called Talking Miniatures that I, I, I administer, where people just come in. It's an open, it's an open Facebook group just to talk about the book and miniatures. And, and since it was first launched, it's just been fantastic hearing other people's stories. I was telling you earlier about the Norwegian guy that you know remembers going to the plaza when he was a kid and going out to shopping bags full yeah. of stuff, and he's bought a copy of the book. And just said, books wonderful, what, yeah. what a face. And getting that feedback from people is worth more than anything to me. That justifies the five years because it meant that what John and I wanted to do has, has struck a chord with people, and yeah. that's just fantastic. Do you know what I like is the fact that Andy Chambers on that back of that book, although he's changed quite a lot from the old white dwarf photograph, he still pulls exactly the same poses, yeah. which, is, which is slightly <laughs> off at an angle looking upwards. <laughs> Amazing, yeah, yeah. You used to have massively big high hair and a really quite fluffy well, side Well, it was his, his Lemmy look, wasn't well, it? Well, it was, yeah, absolutely right. He was in his mid, mid late 80s, early have 90s Lemmy look. Have you still Lemmy got look. more people that now since doing this that you in the wings that you could now can track down to do a third there are, volume? I mean, people keep asking, are the people that we would love to have talked to? Yes, there were. Um, mm. Some of them were working for Games Workshop and we would love to have talked to those, but we couldn't yeah. because they're bound by confidentiality. Some people we approached and they were a bit kind of not not sure, not sure. I'm not going to name names on that one because yeah. that would be unfair and un yeah. unreasonable. You know, you mentioned Dave Andrews earlier. I would love to get yeah, a conversation can't with get Dave him. Andrews. <laughs> but we can't get him because yeah. just, I mean, Dave's history of the company and what Dave has done is just awesome. I mean, we're in a similar boat really with Dave aren't we yeah, we yeah. were desperate to have him on the yeah, show but yeah, can't yeah, for the same yeah, exactly so there are lots of people that we like to catch willing people to retire well, people. Do, I mean, we were lucky. We, we were lucky. We were lucky to get Jervis. We yeah, got Jervis, Jervis in yep. August. He just retired in that July, yeah, and we got yeah, Jervis. And obviously, John Blanche has um, left now. Yeah, yeah. And he's retired. Uh, I saw Jez a couple of weeks ago because it was Andy Jones's birthday, and Jez was there. And I said to Jez, "Jez, I'd love to talk to you." Jez, Ali Morrison. Yeah. I'd still like to get Dave Gallagher as yeah, another because yeah. Dave's artwork is part oh, of that yeah, seminal yeah. period again. I mean, there are lots of people. Should there be a volume three? We had a book sign here on the Warlord Open Day and we had Alessio Cavatori and he was saying I think he said I think you should do Talking Miniatures the next generation so Alessio Cavatori Thomas Purinin yeah, yeah. So, yeah. those, those guys, people who've been there after this and have now of, left the, as well you know, these are the yeah. old gits this is the yeah. first generation <laughs> yeah, yeah. but the second generation's there and, and is there another book in us there might be I think we need to know if this strikes a chord with people, we'll only know that partly through feedback, but obviously people buy it and we get sales, then we'll kind of go, maybe it's worth doing another one. Maybe it's doing more. I mean, it's nice as a, what I call a coffee table book, because yeah, yeah. books, I mean, information on the internet, like 
like listen to audio books and like audio chats and stuff like that. It's nothing this is the same as having a book Pe- in your hand. People said to me, "Are you going to do an ebook?" And I just said, "No." Yeah. I'm really old, and I really like books, yeah. and I like the physical quality of a book and the smell of oh, a book lovely. when it's new. Yeah, it's really nice. oh, yeah. And we deliberately did it, you know, A4 size, so it will sit on your shelf alongside. Slaves to Darkness, yeah. amazing, 40k, Warhammer roleplay, Warhammer yeah. fancy battles. Pure coincidence. Pure yeah. coincidence, we didn't plan that, of course. But that's where it sits. And we wanted something that was beautiful. Yeah. And that's why we did two volumes. We thought, if it's 500 pages, we do a single volume, it's really hard to bind without it cracking and splitting. Mm, yeah. And you can't kind of hold it on your lap because it's a bit fucking heavy. Yeah. Thing. And we said, do two volumes, put it in a nice slip case, Bugger the expense yeah. because that slip case actually costs more than each of those. Books. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah wow. so, well, because this is really complex cardboard engineering. I won't go into the details, <laughs> but you can't do the slip case until you've printed the books because you don't know the weight of the paper. And then it's got to be able to grip the books where they're in, but not so tight that they. Yeah. La la la. You can see it. I do this for a living. I can't help it. I can't help it. I, but I like the way you warn that you're not going to. <laughs> and then to. <laughs> well, I'm not going to. And then I can't help myself because. I'm sorry, fellas, but it's all right. <laughs> well, well, if you've heard our other podcasts, it's a bit similar. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we just wanted something that was beautiful, that, was be- that, that people would treasure and keep and go, I love that, I love that book, and go back to it time and time again yeah. and never lend it to their mate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. If you didn't get Buy it. your own. So, so people say, is there going to be an e book here now? Heresy. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, but fair. Don't sit on the fence. <laughs> so, Tom. And, and a preface some of these questions. Our, our our patron community. You can bleep that. You can bleep that. <laughs> don't don't bleep it. Leave it in. Leave it in. Our patron community is a bit odd, like us. Uh, so we might have some odd questions. Some okay, go, might go, be go, 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 Relate go, go, about go. your favourite we'll cheese. We'll do our best. We'll do our very best. <laughs> um, I think this one's more aimed at you, John. Um, if you could design a mini range or anything not taking into account IP laws etc if you could make a specific army faction what would it be is the examples here are like the Firefly range of TV show stuff um, is it a, a game system that you've wanted to hook into that you're not quite got to, I'd like to, to have done Star Wars properly yeah yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm <laughs> yes. not a Star Wars fan at all because I, I, I don't really like Star Wars yeah. apart from the, the shooty bits with walkers and things mm. are fantastic but the stuff that's come out has underwhelmed me, oh. and uh, shall we say, and uh, you know, and I'd lo- doing big battles of Star Wars properly would be great. Would you be talking like more sort like of twenty eight mil, twenty eight, not 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 man size, epic scale or anything yeah. like that? Man size, but, man size. See, good. I, I'm I'm there. Fifteen yeah. mil, I'm not into twenty eight yeah, mil. Is I, I think I, I've got one of the test test. Um, models that uh, Games Workshop made years ago in my yeah Bob talked about, about that which is lovely so uh, I look at him and go mm, if only <laughs> <laughs> Space Marines are better so <laughs> uh, we've got two questions uh, one for each of you from T.Y. Browning okay. Robin do magazines like White Dwarf still have a place in today's media landscape oh that's a very clever question uh, yes they do hmm. yes they do for the same reasons that they always did it's different obviously back in the day there was no internet if you were into Games Workshop, if you are into the hobby, if you are into Toy Soldiers, you got a copy of White Dwarf and it was sexy and exciting. And, you know, we used to sell 120,000 copies a month. Um, in the media landscape, I think they have, a, they, ha- they have a life for the same reason. I still buy magazines because of, of things that I'm interested in because I like, I like the tangible physical quality mm. of them. It's not the same on my phone. It's not the same on my iPad. It just doesn't do it yeah. for me. Now, I'm old. My kids live in that digital world. Yeah. yeah, that's the world they live in, and I don't see them buying magazines in the same way. But I think magazines. It's the, the problem is actually then the cost of production, yeah. the cost of production, cost of just distribution, and all of the rest of those costs because you've got to sell a lot. We were selling a lot of white dwarfs in the day, yeah. you know, say one hundred twenty thousand each issue in five languages in across all continents of the world. But I think they do. I like magazines. I like tangible physical things. Yeah. You know, I've still got next to my desk. All of the White Dwarfs all stacked up, all, all lined up. <laughs> Amazing. And, I, and I really like them. And I'm part of a Facebook group called White Dwarf Through the Years, 1975. And the guys there, I, for me, it's it's a kind of a joy. I, won't, I will stop speaking in a minute. <laughs> but stuff that I did 30 years ago now, people are still talking about. And that's not about my ego. It's just that people mm. love them. People talk about the early battle reports, yeah, the Light yeah. Up Craft World versus the, the Blood Angels, that stuff. And you can't imagine how 
hard what hard work it was to produce that but people still love it and would they still love it if yeah. it was just a digital if it was pixels so slight sidetrack didn't you do the first battle report for white dwarf yes i did yes i thought you did yes i did my first battle report was actually before i worked for the company i was a youth worker in london I used to run a, a youth center in southeast london and I, of course, I used to play Warhammer with the kids <laughs> and D and D. And one of the kids said to me, "Why don't we do a Warhammer game for um, children in need?" It was the kind of first Thames telethon. And so we got open the youth club Friday night, got all these kids in, stayed up all night playing Warhammer until <laughs> Sunday morning. And I wrote it up as a battle report and sent it to White Dwarf, and it got published. And that was what that was part. That's of, so cool. That was part of the reason I got a job at Workshop because I'd, I'd been published in White Dwarf. And so the first battle report was the Battle of Carrick Mound. Mm. I think it was issue one one eleven one oh nine something like that. And then a couple of months later, I saw an ad for games developers uh, editors, and I went, "I can do that." Yeah, and you did. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to your, um, uh, what would you like to make as a as a faction is what we all call them these days, which drives me mad as a thing. But an army, <laughs> an army of factions, for God's sake. Uh, but uh, one of the good stories from the 1970s, there was a company called Timpo Miniatures, which mm -hmm. you probably before your time, they used to make 54 millimeter plastic cowboys and Indians, Crusaders, uh, World War II stuff, mm. uh, with swappable parts, so you could swap out the guns. Mm. And, the, and you swap it. Swap it, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, swap it. And, and it was all very cool for children's toys, mm. uh, but they were quite nicely sculpted. And they uh, they, they're, uh, they had a sales meeting for the, what they're going to do next year, and their, their, uh, their boss came very excited because he had secured a, a license, mm. which in 1970s would be quite cool licensing wasn't really done for toy soldiers mm. and that sort of thing and uh, he says he said well what have you got so he said well I've got in here in this box I've got some mock-ups of what we're going to be bringing out and uh, drum roll and they brought out these fantastic looking um, Captain Scarlet models mm. Captain oh Mitchell, wow Captain Scarlet Captain mm. Black you know, looking really cool painted up and he said you know we've got the license to produce these and the sales guy said what about the baddies? Yeah, absolutely. That was immediately where my mind went. Was that, yes. Unfortunately, there are no baddies. Yes, yeah. Because they're Mr. Ons, yeah. who yeah. are best represented by two torches. Yeah. 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 So that rather fell on its face, yeah. that one. Yeah. 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 So I won't do that. Yes. Well, it was a bit like that. Good idea. A lot of Jerry Anderson stuff was like that, wasn't it? Because the UFO TV series, you've seen the UFOs, but you never seen who was flying them no, or anything. It could have like, been fantastic. I want yeah. to see the bad guys, please. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, the fish men were great, though, in Stingray. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. Uh, oh. And those and those fish those fish sort of submarines. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. I, I, this is a question for you, John. It's pretty much similar to the last one we asked, so uh, I won't ask that. Which is, what would, which IP would you turn into a tabletop war game? Star Wars. There you go. And make it better, apparently. Well, yes. <laughs> um, oh right. Okay. Uh, Bear with me. Go. Uh, hi both. Question: How do you feel about the peppery deliciousness of haggis pakora? Follow up: Why is the haggis pakora's humani humanity's Finnish fusion food? Would you? F we'll move on. I have no, <laughs> no idea, no idea where left, that was going. We left a delight sometimes, but that's really left a delight. Yeah. Uh, I'll just turn it back haggis on, pakora. So. You don't want to talk oh. about haggis to Robin. He's a he's a veggie. Yeah. He, he wouldn't be able to comment on. No, that. I mean I've tasted haggis in the past, but I, I can't recall. I've tasted veggie haggis, but I don't think that's veggie really haggis. haggis. I hear it's for breakfast, from what I understand. Uh, one for you, John. Any plans for more Romanian units for bolt action? Romanian. Funnily enough, we were just talking about it the other day. One of the lads in the store was talking about uh, making. You know, he's he's got, writing an article on it, and he's talking about. He's talked exactly about which plastic box sets to combine to get another four Romanian units. Um, but it'll be coming up on our website. So there are some plans. Amazing. And the, the apparently they used a lot of those Adrienne helmets, uh, which are the French pattern helmets. And as we're just releasing the French ones, that'll free up uh, models to, to do Amazing. more Romanians. Fantastic. Uh, Favourite uh, biscuit to go with tea for both of you? If you drink tea. Garibaldi. Garibaldi? Mm. Oh. It's molded, holds its moisture. Uh, <laughs> when I'm in traditional mode, digestive, but, you know, radical is fig roll. Oh. <laughs> Jeez, that was like a straw. <laughs> <laughs> I like fig rolls, but yeah, yeah. Fig rolls, fig, fig, very often fig rolls are God's biscuits. I can eat a pack in one. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. They are surprisingly good. Yeah. <laughs> there are some biscuits that, yeah, you, yeah the packet you, isn't you big just enough, don't, is You it? don't open that pack because yeah. it is crack cocaine. Yeah, biscuits. yeah. 
You definitely have to go and like tone down on the sugar after that one. There's been a few comments or questions about fighting in car parks. I'm going to, it seems to be, I'm going to ask you about this when you guys left. So when I left, I apparently had a fight in the car park. You had a fight in the car I park? I didn't, but that really? seems to be like yeah. the story. Yeah, I heard that. D- Duncan had the same thing and many of us, when they've left, have all had the same. Did you guys ever get anything like that? Oh, the reason why John Starlord left was because he had a fight in the car park with such and such. Did you get any like weird rumour mill things when you left? Uh, such as fights in the car park, have- bare chested. <laughs> <laughs> oh, over to Robin. I have no idea. I have no, no idea. I, I mean, I've never heard it from when I was in the studio. So, you know, no. Games Workshop is a genius company to 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 work for, and I had twenty three fantastic years there, and one year that was kind of slightly miserable. Yeah, which was my which was my final year. Yeah, but you have to know that when you walk out of Games Workshop, the door's shut, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, you're done. Yeah. Because it's so focused on the future and yeah. moving forward, it has no time to look back, which is, again, part of the joy of us looking back, yeah, yeah. is because that's where it's focused. And so, no, I just I just had a conversation that said, we think that we've come to the end. Here's some money. We go away, go away nicely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I said, thank you very much, fellas. It's been fantastic. 24 years. Bye for now. Yeah. And walked out. And that, I didn't go back for a year. Yeah. But then I went back to Bugman's and had a coffee in Bugman's a year after I left. I had a fantastic time. People said, oh, it was really nice to see yeah, you. And yeah. actually, you connect back with people who, in that in that way. I and also, you find there's a wonderful world outside of workshop. Yes. With friends yeah. and buddies and people, you know. Which I've certainly discovered. Yeah, well, obviously, yeah. You <laughs> what, a great, what a great question. Yeah. Um, I, I can't think of anything about me, but when I... I've, when you do meet up with old buddies and you go out for a beer and the stories start coming out, the things you don't know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> God, yeah. Thank God. I mean, I was you know, being a fairly senior manager at the time and now you, these guys are telling you what they were doing and you think, oh, for God, God, I didn't know that at the time. Thank you for not telling me then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Blood runs cold when you think about it now. But, uh, but yeah, we try not to put those ones in the bin. Yes, yeah, but, uh, yeah. No, so no, no, no fights in the car park. I have no <laughs> idea what they said about me after I left. Probably. For the Emperor! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, that, uh, you great, will get that. Right, but, it's a great question. But um, as we said many times, it's like it's like leaving the family of Downton Abbey, isn't it? It's like, you've left the family, you're now black sheep, don't return. Yeah, uh, but it, it but is, it, it's, I go back all the time, go to Bugman's like you. you yeah, said. I go, I go to Bugman's and I have a really nice time. Yeah. And, you know, I, a, I left the job, not the people, is the way yeah, I see exactly it. Exactly. Right. That's, so, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, definitely. Um, this one's for you, Robin. Have you uh, had to reject any publications for White Dwarf? Reject any, yeah, like you know, you, you tight deadline, you're there, and you're like, suddenly, like, no, this can't go out. Have you ever had that situation during your tenure? No, White Dwarf had to go out, <laughs> <laughs> White Dwarf had to go out. It, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not kidding. Paul, when, when I put you know, Paul and I have a really interesting conversation, Paul Sawyer, because he followed me really. I mean, there was an interregnum with interregnum is a bit of a bouncy word, is not let's cut that out. There was a gap when Jake, <laughs> there was a gap when Jake Thornton was editor for a while, and then Paul took over. And we have a really interesting conversation about White Dwarf. And actually, one thing that Paul said, people say to him, how, you know, how long does it take to make a White Dwarf? And Paul go, uh, do the maths. It's a monthly magazine. Yeah. <laughs> it comes out once a month. Yeah, but how long does it take? Uh, I to my <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got 21 days. Yeah. Really, 21 days. Certainly <clears throat> back in those days, you had 21 days to get 60 to 84 pages done. And then, you know... F- week at repro printers distribution blah blah, blah. you lost a week you got 21 yeah. days and actually did we reject stuff no some i mean we didn't have many external submissions in those days we occasionally got us external submissions and we if they were great we'd use them mm. that's how thomas Pyrenin came into the business thomas was writing stuff about warhammer in finland mm. and paul sawyer spotted him first because he was working on troll magazine over at the uh, citadel uh, yeah. the journal and he got he got thomas in and he had him for a while and then he, he phoned me up and said i've got this guy i think he's a bit bigger than what i've got you might want to look at him for white dwarf and that's how thomas Pyrrhon came into the business but no uh rejecting stuff i can't we had a lot of work to do each mm. month yeah. and Part of my job as White Dwarf editor was going around the studio and saying, what have you got? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what have you got? Going to the heavy metal team saying, guys, what have you got? You know, obviously they were, they were given. So the new releases, they had to be painted up. They had to go in White Dwarf. Uh, battle report went without saying every month we had to have a battle report. Once battle reports became the core of the magazine. Other stuff, they were adverts or promos. And, and then there was just kind of cool hobby stuff. 
you know, <laughs> there's a series that Rick and I did called uh, How to Make a Warhammer Building Out of a Cornflake Packet, uh, a Pair yeah. of Scissors, and Some PVA Glue. Because people those. people kept saying, oh, terrain's really complicated. Yeah, yeah. And I went, no, it's complicated. And so we said, here are Cornflake Packet, Scissors, PVA, make yeah. a building. And we did that. And, and so those were the things that I kind of remember were exciting, but they, they weren't scheduled. Yeah. They were just stuff. And we were just trying to accumulate stuff in the background, say, okay, we've got a six-page gap in this issue. In it goes. Yeah. And that's what we did, terrain articles and that kind of stuff. So, no, we never rejected anything oh, in that good. way. I always remember going into the last week of the month with White Dwarf and you could see they're all stressed. <laughs> <laughs> so it was always like, the week after that, it'll be chilled. <laughs> well, <laughs> the start of well I have to say, back in the 90s, my wife used to say that she was the only man I knew with a monthly cycle. Is what she used to <laughs> Well, there was one week a month when I would just growl at everybody. And everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's stressy. You've got to get it out. You've got to get it out. You've got to get it out the door. Yeah. Um, Andy H, uh, he's got two questions. I'm going to pick the second one. Do you have any employees that don't collect historicals? And how long has it taken you to break them? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a strong cadre of people who play historicals here. Um, but... Uh, but I don't. Uh, I think they all have their secret space marine armies. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just, just waiting for them to come back out. And, uh, yeah. Because you know you can't get rid of your miniatures, can you? No, no absolutely you not. Can't. I've still got loads in the attic. More to the pity of my wife because she needs that space for other stuff. Uh, how is that Landsnake army kit so good? Uh, would love backstory to that line that's from Burley. Um, I've only seen the set that you've got downstairs. Lanchnecks are lovely. They were designed by um, two Games Workshop, uh, by Games Workshop designer, funnily enough. I've forgotten his name. Damn, damn, damn. He left and did them for us. But they're lovely sculpts. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I wish you'd do more for me. Yes. Uh, but yeah. uh, Lanch there's a new book coming out uh, for the Lanchnecks for Black Powder. So there will be a whole book on Lanchnecks. And Amazing, yeah. Because they're a mercenary army, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. mercenary armies. Yeah. They were fight against everybody uh, particularly against the Swiss mm, so huge pike fighting very unpleasant yeah mm -hmm. that's why they have the big Zavai handers to <laughs> smash through those pikes uh, Andy's asking this uh, another question he's greedy he's gone in for three today um, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a light hearted one with all the lovely historicals you produce do you have any shares in the carpet tile manufacturer line <laughs> you must be propping up uh, a lot of heavily textured carpet tile businesses <laughs> across the UK I guess for gaming tiles oh, okay. <laughs> I think that's where it was going out right. Gotcha. Yeah, I think we probably are. Yeah. <laughs> should a, get some a, shares in it. Should get yes. some shares in it. I know uh, Dave uses towel and like rugs and stuff like that. Well, I'll give you a piece of information which nobody else knows. Oh, I like this. Here's they are now. Really well, I haven't told them yet. <laughs> <laughs> I might not. Um, one of our, our pals, chap called Simon Tift, who used to work at Games mm, Workshop yeah. and Warlord, he uh, used to be on the buying uh, department at Wilco's. Yeah. We unfortunately have just gone bust, but mm -hmm. for Slightly, years, yeah. you know, poor old Wilco's. And I was in one of their meetings, uh, and their head buyer was chatting to them, going through the pricing structure and everything. And she said, oh, well, this is a, uh, and then it was a very dry meeting, <laughs> and barcodes and everything and pricing. <laughs> and she said, uh, it's green scrubbing uh, pads, you know, the green, which you do your... Uh, dishes. dishes with mm -hmm. and she says yes she says, and we want them in the traditional green no other colour and Simon said well, why, why green and she says well she says a lot of war gamers cut them up and use them for hedges oh, wow <laughs> and that's why they're green <laughs> and for the head buyer to tell Simon that was great <laughs> I think you'll find yeah. I mean he was she knows the market she didn't know he was a war gamer so that was particularly amusing Simon probably had one of their mental fish mental fist bump moments yes yes, yes. they do make great hedges <laughs> they do no I mean that, the war games train book that came out probably during like the era that you were uh, running White Dwarf actually um, is such a good source of information yeah, like I've just making them. hedges out of yeah. folding yeah. over some yeah. scouring pads yeah, and then getting some flock on top yeah it's just so it goes good. back to what you say about the uh you know, games play, being a war gamer is DIY, isn't it? It was. I tell yeah. you what, a, a, a month ago, I can't remember, that kind of happened, maybe a month, month or six weeks, I went to uh, Boyle, you know, bring out your lead. Yes. Yeah, the animals yeah. run over at their place. Yeah. And I walked in through the door, and on my right hand side, there was a huge table, huge table covered with epic stuff, you know, Titans and, and tanks. And on that table, they had little minefields barbed wire emplacements and those little bunkers made out of a, a cavalry base as oh. the red slot and that was an article that i wrote in white dwarf 
30 years ago with Andy Chambers about minefields, barbed wire and bunkers yeah. in, in Epic. And of course, the, the, the barbed wire, you get car mesh and you cut it on the diagonal and then you spiral it around a, a bend and make little barbed wire things. And I looked at this and, I looked, and the guy looked at me and I went, brother, I haven't seen this for 30 years. He said, look, I've got the article here. Yeah, it was yeah. just really great. And we had this whole conversation. And then he said to me, he said, you know, the barbed wire is great. He said, but there's no rules here for what happens when the tank drives over the barbed wire. <laughs> So I went, oh no, we missed it, we missed the thing. How do you remove them from the tabletop? Yeah. <laughs> and it was great. It's that, that for I mean, me, that, that stuff. Even that, great. a lot of those skills from that stuff is still relevant today. I well, mean, it's like, like, it's like the barbed it's, wire thing. And, absolutely. How do you make barbed wire? Yeah. How do you all that stuff. Kind of, all of that, you know, cornflake packet and a pair of scissors. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's terribly it's, satisfying, isn't it? Because it also mm. means you can involve kids and things like that. You, can, you get your daughter or your son and say, yeah. come on, you, yeah. you, you don't know what you're building, but let's build a house today. Of course, yeah, it's yeah, a bunker yeah. is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you get them involved and slapping paint on and it's just a great join in, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it is. And... Uh, well, it's a shame you can't get bendy plastic straws in because you don't get plastic yeah, straws. There's all, bendy yeah, plastic yeah. straws for Necromunda Great buildings for with a tin can and yeah. a bendy yeah, straw. Yeah, yeah. All the pipe. Oh, that was really cool. Yeah, it's that, that little bit you just pull out and it goes around. It's yeah, just perfect. It's yeah. just, yeah. Like, just all, love. All, all of that. All 40k uh, refineries were built with a, uh, a bendy straw. Exactly. And, and I kind of, I really love that DIY aspect mm. of the old terrain building. You know, I mean, the, the new terrain, the plastic injection mold terrain is great. great. Yeah. But it's, it's still like making stuff. It's not for me. Yeah. I like making shit. Uh, Alex Austin is asking with a focus on historical gaming and potentially the best kit <laughs> the lunch neck <laughs> double soldiers do you reenact at all do you guys do any I used to yeah. when I was from 18 to 50 um, um, uh, English Civil War oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, running Newcastle's Tertio the finest and big, biggest Tertio on the field so I did 30 years of fantastic fun Oh, was it all just that period that you did during pretty the Pretty much. Yeah. yeah, beating people up legally. It was, <laughs> yeah. it was absolutely hilarious. <laughs> in fact, in some early White Dwarfs, there are adverts for your... Yeah, for my old regiment. For your yeah, regiment, yeah, looking for recruits. Yeah. They're the back still back. around, the regiment's still around. Sir yeah. Gilbert Horton's company of foot, fine body of men. <laughs> <laughs> um, has it informed air product development as well? Oh, yeah. That kind of stuff. Oh, I, I tell you, the other thing about that American Civil War box, other than the Foot Locker... <laughs> um, was I won't go into detail. Uh, <laughs> but, um, Give us some more detail. I was, watching, I was watching a battle reenactment in America of American Civil War, and it was one of these huge ones. They had you know, ten thousand people on the field, and I was watching these regiments coming forward, blue blue coated Union soldiers. And as they came forward, they probably had two hundred men in each block, so it was pretty pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, you know, good very, size. Very good. And I was thinking, what's different there? And I'm looking at them. I think, what's different to that? and wargaming. Why does that look fantastic? And it was because it was just a wall of blue. Mm. I suddenly realised that when you, people always, because wargames, most of us are a bit mean, um, we space out our models we, uh, with a gap in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. And when you look at a, a group of Union soldiers, they literally were pressed elbow to elbow. Yeah. And that's what you had to do. And red coats and everything else. So you've got your first rank, 100 men wide, and then you've got a second rank anyway. So if there, if there was a gap, yeah. all you still see is blue. Yeah. So that's where the epic stuff came from. I wanted to actually show that's what would look coming towards yeah, you. Wouldn't yeah. see any gaps at all, mm -hmm. apart yeah. from the casualties, yes. Yeah. But to begin with, that one. So that's where that one came from. Oh. From I think the uh, I think the invention of fragmentation was what put an end to that standard, <laughs> standard that close to each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sort of when I used to spend a lot of time walking across the countryside in the military, in the military, we walked in diamonds. So the hope was the grenade landed in the middle and no one got it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fragmentation and solid shot. It's not very easy. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, asking me about my reenacting, I, I, I do War of the Roses with, with the Andrews. Oh, cool. uh, so uh, that, that, there you go. It's not gothic or Milanese, I'm afraid. Uh, great name, Hick Dead. To everyone, what do you do when you buy shoes? And what have you... <laughs> Buy shoes. Hick dead. Hang on. Let, let's let, uh, let's let's skip to the end a little bit. Uh, or do you tempt the chaos gods? Oh, you know what? Sorry, mate. Sorry. This oh, that, that, that the one that was to do with laces. It's something to do with laces. Uh, and I I'm moving on because he was mentioned just for yeah. Uh, to John, with uh, this is from Matt Lumley. Uh, with Warlord's focus on historicals rather than fictional conflicts, uh, has there ever been a particular period of history that they there was a desire to replicate on the tabletop, but the business side made it uh, unviable? Um, also, Woodwall 1, 28 mil, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, those are great, great questions. Um, World War 1, 28 mil. Um, uh, we nearly did a World War 1, 
Mm. I think that would obviously be in a kind of late war, 1917, 18, mm. where by the time tanks were tanks and movement was back in, uh, yeah. not just the horrible trench warfare. So we nearly did that. We didn't. Uh, sometimes, though, you can pick a period which you wouldn't think would sell terribly well. Mm. Uh, uh, but if you build it, and they will come. So I had this obsession with motor torpedo boats. I don't know why. Oh, <laughs> I had a toy one of them as a kid. Well, what a cool to, thing they were. Cool. I think it was because they were in Victor comic. It was Killer, yes, yeah, Killer yeah. Kennedy was his name, and Doyle, his <laughs> lieutenant. And they sank more German battleships than were ever built. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I always wanted to make this game with, with motor torpedo boats. And my wonderful studio would always say, yes, great idea. <laughs> uh, and then put it to the bottom of the schedule and say, yeah, we'll put it in if we've got time. Yep, yeah, possibly, yep. Yeah. So I put it in and slip it off the schedule another year. Uh, so three it. years goes past. I think, wait a minute. Yeah. It should be at the top of the schedule now after three years. Something's a foot. <laughs> uh, so, I, so, so I sort of sold the game to them again. They went, okay. <laughs> I said, you know, it doesn't have to have an extensive tail. It just plastic motor torpedo boats you know, just German e-boat and a British MTB and so they, they let me have it and, and it, it went really well <laughs> and uh, it's still being sold and that's mm, 10 years on now oh, amazing but so it was a build it and they will come because yeah. most people didn't know they'd love model boats but we put the model boats we put a frame on the front of War Games Illustrated yeah. and so that that, that squirts 15,000 of them into the world yes and there's yeah. not a war gamer in the world who won't think oh Mm. Well, at least I'll glue it together and think, yeah. ooh, yeah. just spray that up. And before you know it, they think, oh, I might get a box of those. Yeah. <laughs> Play again. Nice. Yeah. And off they go That's and build it and they will come. I Smart. Think. Yeah, so the, and you wrote the rules for that. I did. You? Marvellous game. <laughs> <laughs> What's Marvelous. that game called again? <laughs> Available Cruel for... Seas. <laughs> Cruel Seas. What a great name as well. Still a good names. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Uh, David Norman, are there any art books or miniature art collections, etc., that you turn to for inspiration, or stand out over the years, or are standouts over the years? Um, I guess the, there's the there. uh, Dave Taylor stuff always blows me away. Yeah, Dave Taylor stuff is cool. At, uh, um, yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to picture Dave Taylor stuff. I recognise the name. Um, he's just put out a whole load of books on. Uh, is it historical based stuff? No, it? no, uh, mainly, fan mainly, oh, okay. mainly fantasy, fantasy and science fiction. He used to work for a for workshop mm. in uh, Australia. Oh, Australian, Australian boy. Australian boy, now in uh, America. Oh, I think he did a, a black and white drawing of um, a chaplain on bike years ago. That's probably why I recognise the name. Or was he, he was very good with his guns, is that right? Was, mm. I don't know about that, but any. As in, like, drawing. Like, any Dave Taylor thing. stuff is uh, fantastic. Um, other ones, uh, inspirations? Um, it's hard to say, but I mean. Art books, you know, I go back to the early, some of the early workshop stuff, you know, the Ian Miller and the Blanche mm. stuff from that, that period. Mm. I also really like the Perry stuff that's at the Leeds Royal Armouries, you know, if you want some spectacular visual stuff. Mm. Their Waterloo stuff at their the... Their dioramas and Their things. dioramas mm. that Perry's have got on the Royal Armouries <coughs> and Leeds. Yeah. yeah. Inspired, and actually yeah. there is the... What's the guy's name? I've been a couple of times with Rick to the Chelsea, the Army Museum in Chelsea. Mm. There's the Siborne model. Siborne, yeah. The Siborne model. Cyborne, Cyborne. There's a guy called Siborne who made a model, you know, with, after the Battle of Waterloo. He made a model of the Battle of Waterloo and he cast up all the miniatures there, tiny little miniatures. Yeah, I've seen, he, it. I've he seen that in the flesh. And, it, and it's, in, it's in the, and I've been it's a couple it. of times to see that. And of course, he made this fantastic model. And, you know, this is an era where there's no films, there's no TV, mm. there's no, you know, it moved around the country and yeah. um, he used to show it off. But the problem was, of course, he got in trouble with it because when um, Duke of Wellington became the Prime Minister, in the Sybil model, he has the Prussians arriving <laughs> And people were going, oh, look, the Prussians have turned up and hit the French in the flank. And it's and uh, there was this whole argument about when did the Prussians actually arrive? And of course, the Duke of Wellington said, well, that's not the way it was. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> and, and he died in penury. But it's a fantastic model. And it's there in the Royal Army Museum yeah, in Chelsea. That's a good one to remember. And I love to go and see that yeah. model. Yeah. Well, worth looking it's out for that when you go to the Royal Army then. Not the Royal Army, yeah, the Chelsea Army Oh, Chelsea, Army, Chelsea Army, Army Museum. Yeah, which did, is where he did a second one, yeah. which is dark on a larger scale, of the of the uh, Durlans Corps being th whacked by the Scots Greys, mm. and that is at the Army uh, at uh, at Leeds. Leeds. Yeah, yeah. there are yeah. two Durlans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the British Army Museum. I know from that. That's where um, the Mayback Gun is yeah. from. Uh, the uh, the SAS 
uh, yeah. trooper. Um, oh yeah, that one, twenty five pounder. Yeah. Where he fired it on his own for God knows how long. Yeah, three man job. Yeah. And of course, the problem with the cyborg model as well is he went. He actually did a topographic survey of the land of Battle of Waterloo, and then he went to talk to all the commanders and said, you know, what were you doing on there? Oh, my lads were in the front of the fight. Of course, he will. <laughs> so nobody yeah. said, oh, we sat around all day, did, yeah. did bugger all. <laughs> it's one of them battles where no one was at the back. No, no one was. There. Oh, we were there. Chefs were. We, the f- we were staring yeah. to the French bayonet. Yeah. Chefs were at the front as well. <laughs> Exactly, and that's the way it went. So, but it's a, it's a beautiful model if you're ever in that neck of the woods. Yeah, and it's definitely. an inspiration. I find it still inspiring. I, I always used to, uh, my my like gold holy grail when I was really young was going to Bosworth Visitor Centre and seeing that little display. But I really liked was they had large scale at the front and they got smaller scale mm-hmm. as it went further yeah. back. And I always used to love looking at that. I didn't know nothing about the Wall of Roses at that time. I just liked seeing knights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was copied, and of course. That was copied. If you'd go to White Dwarf in those early years when um, Epic came out, mm. I think Chris Colston who was the photographer. Um, back then wow. he set up some pictures with space marines in the front some epic space marines yeah, in the back yeah. and used that force perspective That's and there's some really cool Amazing. pictures that he did back then that are in Dwarf yeah just getting that sense of scale is really yeah, good yeah. and nowadays I guess with all the different scales of miniatures that are out there you know big tricks do well, 54 mil Napoleonic yeah. so you could work your way down from 54 the thing, thing is to. with digital you can trick anybody it's just it doesn't yeah. work anymore yeah, yeah, then I it was know. hardcore again yeah. we're talking the book about you know back in those days you want smoke effect no photoshop what you do drag on a bag <laughs> Drop yeah. it on the name, yeah. take I mean, a snap. People do with vapes, don't they? That, that, was, that, was how you, that was how you did the, the smoke yeah, effects. It's, it's come back into fashion that's, now because of vapes. Yeah, yeah that's exactly how you used to do smoke effects on We had to face. turn off the um, fire alarms in uh, the photography studio because the smoke effects would set them off. No, I didn't have fire uh, alarms. And we had that with Bat Report as well, didn't we? We got into trouble a few I times mean, on yeah, the alarms. People sitting smoking a fag with some petrol and some cow <laughs> and getting <laughs> faced up. No one cared about self preservation. No, none then. of that nonsense back then. <laughs> So Rich McPherson says hello to both of you, but my question is for John. Uh, you have a mighty collection of weaponry uh, and other military paraphernalia. What is your holy grail that you've been after? The one I... Um, and he said, why is it not sharp sword? Which we know you've got a cavalry version of that. I've used in my office there. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've held uh, it. The one, I, the one I um, need for my collection is a Browning automatic rifle, mm. a VAR. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're so bloody expensive. When I started collecting, I just wanted the average sections weapons for the Brits. So I got a Bren, a Sten, an Enfield, and a mm. Webley, uh, and then a, a couple of other bits and bobs. And then I got the the Mauser MP40 and MP44 yeah. and uh, all the cool stuff. And uh, and then I got the Garand and the M1 carbine and a Browning uh, pistol. But the thing I haven't got is the, is the American light machine gun mm. because they, they cost about three grand. Now... You could get a Bren now. You could go. I could, you know, I could order you a Bren tomorrow for about four hundred quid, four hundred and fifty quid, mm, yeah. nicely deactivated. Yeah, know, yeah, but, yeah, But enough moving parts to be interesting, you know. Mm. And uh, but you try and buy a, a blooming BAR, and they're th- two thousand three hundred or three thousand pounds, and I just don't want to spend that much. Yeah. But they must have made so many more BARs than they did Brens yeah. through, during the world. It was, yeah. it was invented in nineteen ten, <clears throat> I think. Yeah. And uh, anyway, they still use them in Vietnam, even. Oh, so wow. they, so there's, they must have made millions of the bloody yeah. things, but I don't know. So I don't know why they're so expensive. But if you'd like to send me one, yes, yes. So <laughs> you we'll mention in dispatch. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll put John's email in there. So just Sunday, contact Sunday him. You can get in touch with you now, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. I've got a beer. Well, if it's less than two grand, I'll have it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember my grandfather getting within a, a nat whisker of. Um, coming home at the end of the Second World War with a Japanese officer's sword oh, and a Luger mm. and got caught at the last ah, minute. Oh. The so yeah. my, my granddad used to work in a factory and I have two deactivated Mills grades, um, which I use as bookends. Um, but they have the working parts in it, so it you know, flicks up the uh, the handle when you take the key out and stuff yeah, yeah. like that. But it just, it's just, it's got no fuse in it. There's no way you can... Must amuse your grandchildren. <laughs> oh, well, uh, there was a, a situation that I freaked my sister out when she a, thought it was real. I a cap version of one of those when I was a kid. I forgot, you know, it was, like, it was a grenade. And you put a cap in it, and you pulled the pin and the handle flew and bang! Yeah, <laughs> oh, amazing. There was, there was quite a... Uh, I'm going to contradict myself. There was quite a famous writer who about 15 years ago... <laughs> Uh, said to his wife, I'm just going to stay up a bit later to do some writing. And she went to bed. She came down the next morning 
And the guy had an Italian grenade, one of the Red Devil grenades, which had a really tiny percussion pen. And he had it as a paperweight, but in reality, it had gone off and killed him. It oh. went off through the night and blew, you know, but killed him. Oh, no. And she wow. didn't even wake up. Um, <laughs> and the poor devil had killed himself. He was obviously fiddling with it and, and oh, up it went. No, was life, I'm trying to think of his name. Um, but what a way to go. Yeah. Well, let's <laughs> hey. put a damper on the rest of the year. <laughs> I put a on the rest of his evening. Next, next question, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on, something a bit more lighthearted. Yeah. Uh, what, if anything, do you miss nowadays that you had or could do back when you were, were working at GW? Do you miss anything from the days? That you... Oh, the people. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely the people, um, you know, and... Uh, the people. Yeah, the people. And, uh, and a great yeah. common cause of that you're all pulling yeah, together. yeah. You're in a tribe. It's very tribal. Yes, and, uh, yes, yes, it is. When you're in a tribe, it's very, it's very strong. Yeah, you know, and it's, uh, that, that's what I miss. Yeah, actually, I had a, I had a, a Warhound Titan, one of the early resins one mm. before Forge World. Yeah, that I that I'd model up the <laughs> dangerous. Was that armor cast? Was it? It was armor cast. It was no, an armor cast Warhound Titan. It was about yay big, and I'm really super detailed with guitar strings, you no know, heavy duty mm. E nylon oh, wow. strings yeah. for the cables and all of that. And I had a Blood Angels army, and it just got absorbed into the oh. studio playtest armies at one point, <coughs> and I lost it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. Blimey. I Do never really worry. It's probably I, sitting on a shelf somewhere. It's probably just down there, it? it was there. It just it, must be somewhere. It was I just go and give him a knock and go, there's not a war out taking around here, is there? It? it was it was <laughs> it was certainly there. It was there when we were at Castle Boulevard. Yeah. It I know it went to Lenton and it was part of the studio, you know, the Andy and Jervis yeah. used to use that. But whatever happened to it, I have no yeah. idea. I mean, as an army painter, I used to use lots of my old collection stuff to, to help out with projects, and they just disappeared. Yeah, they just disappeared. So just that, disappeared into the, the the ether. Apart from apart from that, with John, yeah, I just it was just well, the people and times times a strange thing. You know, mm. this, we are talking for me thirty years ago, mm. and that's a long time ago. And actually, it was just a buzz. Yeah, yeah. It was just it was just what we did and to be in that place with those people at that time yeah what what a gift i mean like you were saying earlier like you know you had one bad year but it, it and that that's still like for me i, I had a couple of like mm, no, not so great but it doesn't tarnish the rest no it doesn't because i look it back doesn't. at the rest with such and, fondness and stuff and 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 again we we've you know we've alluded to it but the people that i'm i mean the people we've lost you know we lost yeah. we lost wayne england and he was just yes, he, yeah. he, he was too young he was 56 and uh, we lost Hal, Richard Halliwell, yeah. uh, Rick's old buddy. And Hal was just such an extraordinary character. I mean, just an amazing polymath kind of genius games designer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Space Hulk, Dark Future. These games flowed out of Hal. And, and again, I'm going back to the book, Andy Chambers talks about some of his early experiences with Hal. Well, Hal was playing, a, uh, playing or playtesting a real proto version of War Master, which later came out with just some genius ideas and he was just an amazing designer and an amazing yeah. character so. I, I suppose it's like what you touched at the very start which is why this is I think so important because like I, I remember all of the characters in here when I was much younger and mm. they were much younger mm. but they're now like grandparent age and they've got families of their own and you know life is going on <laughs> and, you know if you don't capture that that those stories and stuff it's just going to disappear no, no, no. and be forgotten no, no, which no. is such a shame no exactly, yeah, exactly. so it's, I think it's key it's, it's, it's really really good um, I guess we've got one more question. Uh, plenty of time. Uh, plenty of time. Well, we've got, well, we've got two. I was just go, trying go, to go. throw them out. Chris. So we've got one for you, uh, Robin, uh, which um. is White Dwarf was always been an excellent product, uh, publication, but what regular feature was there? Was was your favourite when you worked there? Bat reports. Bat reports. Yeah. Bat reports. I, I guess you d drove that as an article. Right? I, so I I got sense, I got really. back before I joined Games Workshop. You know I would I. You know, going back in the back in the day, from about the age of eleven onwards, I, I I discovered something called the War Gamers newsletter, little photocopied thing, and uh, I got into war gaming. And then later in my teens, maybe early twenties, I really got into Avalon Hill games. Mm. You know, hex based games. And I was a big squad leader player. They did this John Hill designed a game called Squad Leader, yes, which yeah. is basically a toy soldier game, but with cardboard counters. And I was a big fan of Squad Leader. And in the general magazine, which was their magazine, 
their equivalent of White Dwarf, they used to do this thing called after action reports, mm. where they'd get the two designers who would talk about the game, what they were going to do, what their plans were. They'd then go through the game dice roll by dice, dice roll, and they'd do a summary at the end. Heresy! Like, that didn't go very well. Oh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah. My plan was genius. <laughs> and that's what was in my head. Yeah, yeah. And so when I got into the studio and I was given White Dwarf or said, right, you're going to edit White Dwarf now, however that happened, I went, I know what we can do here. That I want people, and again, think back to a world with no internet, no YouTube, no way of communicating visually. I wanted people to be able to look inside the studio and see not just people, but Jervis Johnson, Andy Chambers, Rick Priestley, Nigel Stillman, playing games and talking about it and presenting it. Yeah. And that I, that was my thing. And I was obsessed with it. And I wanted that to happen and I made it happen. Yeah. And I'm really proud of that. And it's still going strong today. I'm really proud uh, of that. Even to the po point where they do digital versions. And not just with Workshop, but like other companies. And I think it's, I got hold of White Dwarf. I think 139 was my first issue. It was probably about August 90. And I think it was October, the first battle report yeah. appeared. And I went, I know what this is and I know what's going to happen here. I, I, you, you remind me something you had your interview with Jordan from Jordan Sorcery I was yeah, yeah. watching that no, really enjoyed it good chat give it a watch um, when you're talking about squad leader because me and my dad used to play that loads yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I love that game and it got to the point where we were playing it you got your little cards yeah. of like units and stuff did like you that. used to get free counters from them <laughs> no yeah. what, is that a thing <laughs> <laughs> But we, we wanted to get into the miniature side. I, I'm, 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 did I, what did I miss? <laughs> I mean, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> but yeah, we wanted to get into the miniature side of it. So yeah, that's yeah. why, like, Rapid Fire, we went into that. Uh, and then obviously now you've done, like, Bolt Action, which is perfect. I, I suppose Flames of War, to a certain degree, is like that kind of smaller scale, but I prefer... Do you want to know something, Chris? Back in the early 90s, I was mm. really into Squad Leader. So I got big sheets of polystyrene and I modelled the squad boards, <laughs> squad leader oh, really? boards, in 3D in big sheets of polystyrene. I used to play with Andy Chambers, yeah, and yeah. we'd do micro armor. We'd have little micro armor, little uh, Skytrex micro tanks, and squads on epic bases. And we used to play squad leader with miniatures. That's <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, every yeah, yeah, because cool. we love the game system. I yeah. love the game system, and that game system uh, with with John Hill's what's called fire for effect. Mm. You know, basically the design parameter of squad leader said it doesn't matter what you do to guys, whether you hit them with a flamethrower, blast them with a tank, stab them with a bayonet, or yeah. shoot at them with a machine gun. They'll do one of three things. They'll either ignore you and carry on fighting. They'll get their heads down and duck, or they'll die. Yeah, yeah. And he said you don't have to worry about the weaponry. Yeah, you yeah. just need to. It's called you know it's 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 called an effect table, and that made its way into Epic Forty K uh, because Jervis and Andy both got squad leader. Yeah, and John Hill as yeah. a as a great designer. Did he do tank commander as well? Because there was, there was well, a, John Hill did quite. He did Panzer leader that's and those books. Yeah, yes, John Hill was yeah. the lead designer yeah. at Avalon Hill. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't. He wasn't John Hill because of Avalon Hill, but he was John Hill was just a great designer yeah. who's no longer with us again. But uh, Jervis. Tips his hat to uh, John Hill, yeah. as does Andy, and yeah, we had I had these big physical 3D model squad leader instead of cardboard boards. I had the real thing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I suppose question to you like, it was in like board games of your like childhood and probably like you know adulthood as well that you wanted to turn into or have now turn into like a miniatures war game. Um, board games. Uh, what did we used to play? Uh, we used to try and play Escape from Colditz. Oh, and yes. Played that many times. It was just mental and nothing happened for hours. We played that with the family <laughs> most, most, <laughs> <times>. overly, <laughs> most overly engineered game ever known to mankind. Um, um, but I mean, it's did lovely. Did we do a, like the, the roll call every so many turns or something oh, like I, that? I was just mad. Yeah. <laughs> so how they, they how it amused us, I don't know. They must have had a lot of time in their hands in college. <laughs> <laughs> it was written by the it escapee, was Pat wasn't Reed, it? Wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. He wrote uh, it. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, uh, Robin very kindly bought me a set, two sets in fact, of Custer's Last Stand Isn't from Waddington's Battle, 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 Battle of the Little Bighorn. Battle of the Bighorn. I've mm. got those in my office. I always wanted that as a kid. And I, yeah, I cornered the eBay market in that game for a while because it was <laughs> one of my breakthrough games as a kid. I just went, Dakar! This is great. Yeah, yeah. And it, was, uh, it is still great. Mm -hmm. It's still great. And I have about 20 copies of it. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, there's a, uh, I'm just trying to remember what, what it was called. Was it called Blue and the Grey or Fire and Fury? But anyway, it was an American Civil War board mm. game with plastic, uh, blue plastic and grey plastic. Mm. Once it's, uh, what's it called? Anyway, it was, it was splendid, and that, that that still inspires me. Yeah, amazing. I think of what it is soon, but I, I always liked the idea. Of, there was a game called Cry Havoc, and I really, I was really into oh, no, that. Oh, I know Cry Havoc. Cry Havoc, standard cardboard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What I used to start was you have like the knight 
on horseback, yeah. Yeah. stunned, so it would yeah. be his horse, then yeah. you'd have like slightly wounded and dead. Yeah. Um, and I guess Baron's War kind of touches on that. So well, they did, they did Samurai Blaze as well, standard game. Mm. They did the yes. Japanese version. Very short, Joe Jones. Diva, was it one of those two, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I can't remember involved. the names. Anyway, it was yeah. wonderful. Yeah, really, I used mm. to love that game system and um, wanted that in miniature form, and I guess it is now, and to a certain degree with Baron's War, but yeah, that was... That was yeah, 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 yeah. So I just went back into... A, one of the first things about when I was about 11 years old, I des- designed, a because of my ethics stuff, designed a game where the mechanic was you had kind of squads of six men and tanks were worth six. And so, but the defender always won draws. So you'd multiply the number of men by the dice roll and then you get an outcome. So actually one, one group of six men could fight off a tank, but yeah. I'm just back in nostalgia. I had a, <laughs> no, I had a flashback <laughs> then. <laughs> Battle cry. That's Battle what Cry. Called. That's what it was called. Battle Cry. That's that's what it was. That was the um, uh, Hasbro, wasn't it? Mm. Was it Hasbro? Something, well, it was one of the big ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, we're all out of questions. Um, is there anything else you want to touch upon or ask before we we close down mm. the chat? Well, no, I think it's been great fun. Yeah, yeah. great no, fun. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for thank you for. You are three of you. You can't see one. Yeah, so. <laughs> he's still there. <laughs> he's still there. Yeah, Looking like well, a horse well, you, race uh, narrator. Uh, I really. <laughs> Lo- love the questions coming in from your punters as well. That's really nice. Yeah, 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 yeah really, that's, really. that's been great fun. Really Keeping great. us on our toes. I mean, the one I didn't ask was, "What's your favourite cheese?" Yeah, yeah. It normally gets asked in yeah, the yeah. episodes. <sighs> Sainsbury's organic cheddar. Oh, oh, oh! Okay. Taste the difference. You oh. know your Sainsbury's. To be oh. fair, I used to work there. <laughs> <laughs> it's the organic cheddar. It's yeah. it's got the right sharpness and the right crumb. <laughs> <laughs> Red Leicester. Red Leicester. <laughs> ah, amazing. I've become my, a f- uh, my favourite for cheese on toast, Red Leicester. Yes. Yeah. It's the only one to do for that. I've become a fan of Aldi's own mild cheddar. I don't uh, know why. It's just yeah. really creamy and really yeah. nice. It's got to be a big fan yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your time with us. Uh, again, check out the book on, you said Amazon is your... It's Amazon.co.uk, yeah. Amazon.com in America, or TalkingMiniatures.co.uk. Yeah. Or, 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 or World of Games. Which, yeah. And the, the, the Talking Miniatures is a portal to the... Yeah. Yes, to all our games because they will pack it up and dispatch it around the world. Amazing! No, it's been great. Can't wait to again probably have you guys on in the future talking about other stuff that's related to miniatures yes, or just please, nostalgia. Just it's nostalgia. nostalgia. It's nostalgia. Not what it used to be, is it? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but again, it's not as not as rose tinted as it used to be. It's all black and white. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. We'll see you soon.